Hello friends, this is Muse Fanfiction. How are you all? I hope you're doing great. So today, we are back with an amazing video on what if Naruto was the Greek shinobi, instructed by the Sage of Six Paths. Here is short summary. Naruto is instructed by the Sage of Six Paths to jump to the world of Percy Jackson and the Olympians. How will the gods react to such a powerful new entity? As someone who lost everything he cares about, read as Naruto forms new bonds, goes on quests, and even finds love. Op Naruto. Fully OOC Naruto. Mokatan and Rinisharing and Naruto. But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now let's start the story. Naruto was meditating on the top of a mountain, on which he lived, this mountain was aptly dubbed, Sage Mountain, by the populace due to the serenity of the environment surrounding it. He was surprised when he was suddenly visited in his mindscape by Hagoromo Otsutsuki, the Sage of Six Paths, though he did not let his emotion show on his face. Hum. I do not sleep, so this cannot be a dream, and I am immune to genjutsus unless they are ranked in the S class. So, I suppose I am actually meeting you, Sage of Six Paths, Naruto said emotionlessly. Yes. Naruto would use the sage mode he learned from the demon fox summoning clan to nourish himself, quench thirst, and refresh his mind. He had no need to eat, drink, sleep, or excrete. The reason he did this was that regular food could not suffice for the amount of energy he required to function, due to his monstrous chakra levels. No need to be so formal, my boy. You may simply call me by my first name, Hagoromo. Hagoromo said with a wave of his hand. Naruto raised an eyebrow before giving a nod. I see. Well then, not that this is not an honor, but why have you approached me, Hagoromo? Naruto asked with a hint of curiosity in his voice. His emotions were heavily suppressed due to the grief of losing everything precious to him. He was born with everything. Family, resources, friends, and automatic respect from the villagers of the Hidden Leaf Village, since he was the son of the Hokage. Not only that, but he was the heir to the Uzumaki clan. But as time progressed, he slowly began to lose them, one by one. His cousin Kimimaro Kagaya, taken from him by a terminal illness. Then his father, Minato Kagaya, the fourth Hokage, killed by Orochimaru after being sufficiently weakened by the same illness as Kimimaro's. Next, his mother, killed by his own hand as she couldn't bear to see him go through with his plan to create peace and end up being killed by the Shinobi Alliance. This came with the added benefit of earning Natsumi's hatred. Next, his genin team, which included his younger sister Natsumi, as well as his surrogate younger brother Sasuke. Leaving the village meant separating from them, in order to be killed by their hands. After that, Itachi left him as well, buried too deep in his grief and guilt after the Uchiha clan massacre, causing him to desire his own death. Once again, he was killed by none other than Naruto himself, to focus Sasuke's hatred on himself. However, during the war, no matter what his team tried, they couldn't kill him. After much effort, Natsumi and Sasuke used their majestic attire Suzano to slice him to bits, which Sakura sealed inside separate stasis scrolls. These were later buried in different parts of the elemental nations. His only precious people who were still alive at that point were himself, Anko, his team, and the demon foxes he was able to summon. The foxes noticed that despite his supposed death, Naruto's name was still on their summoning scroll. Thus, they began their search, stealthily collecting the scrolls from different parts of the elemental nations, until they were able to reassemble Naruto's body at the Demon Fox Valley, hidden from civilization. When Naruto asked why he didn't die, the foxes theorized that due to his use of Demon Fox Sage Mode to sustain himself, which was the method tailed beasts would use to replenish their energy reserves, he essentially became more similar to a tailed beast in terms of his anatomy and physiology. Naruto then traveled, using his incredible sensory abilities to find Anko. He lived with her for around a millennium, after which she passed on, only living to such an age due to Naruto supplying her with chakra. In this time, his sister, Sasuke, and Sakura, as well as any of their descendants that he would like to interact with had already passed on, and due to the differences in the physiology between himself and Anko, he was not able to produce offspring with her. Naruto had spent more than four millennia after this wandering alone, making sure to preserve the peace that he helped create, and knowing that he could not afford to make any more connections with people, as he would outlive them. Hagoromo looked at Naruto sadly, knowing about the difficult life he lived. 
Hagoromo was sure that Naruto was definitely among the top five people who suffered the most throughout their lives. Naruto my boy, I should be telling you of how great an honor it is to meet you, not the other way around. You are the only one I have seen, who managed to create such a lasting peace throughout the world. I am happy that love and understanding among people has triumphed over the enforcement of peace through power. Hagoromo said, giving Naruto a pat on the shoulder. You are wrong Hagoromo. Peace cannot be achieved with only one of love and power. Both are needed. I made the decisions I did after coming to this realization. I am sorry to put it this way, but your ideals were jaded, Hagoromo. You represented a combination of your sons, Indra and Ashura. You had the ability to spread love and understanding among people like Ashura, as well as the power to prevent rebellions, crimes, or any other behavior that would stand in the way of peace. Ashura was too kind to put his foot down and use his power to punish those who got out of line, while Indra was too tyrannical to create a lasting peace that people would enjoy. You failed to see this and chose one over the other as your successor rather than allowing both of them to take your mantle. Naruto told Hagoromo, harshly reprimanding him for his ideals. Hagoromo took a step back as Naruto's words hit him. Had he really messed up that badly? He had to give his respect to Naruto now, not only for Naruto's past actions, but also for the courage Naruto had to show him how he was wrong. I, I see Naruto. You have given me a lot to think about. I suppose I was wrong to call you, my boy, seeing that you are perhaps much wiser than ever was. But how did you know that your plan would succeed? Hagoromo asked curiously. It is rather simple Hagoromo. By playing my part as a villain, I claimed that I would use my power to force peace. My sister Natsumi, being as idealistic as she is, challenged me by saying that she would follow your ideals and concepts of Ninshu to create peace. It is obvious that this is what should be outwardly said, in order to fool everyone into thinking that this peace would last as long as there is a common understanding between them. However, human beings are creatures of desire. They always tend to want more than they have. Contrastingly, they are also lazy and greedy, and tend to choose the easy way to accomplish something rather than putting in time and effort. When they are not able to get what they want, they threaten peace, and action must be taken behind the scenes to put them down. By defeating me, Mateem showed the world that their ideals trump mine, and also subtly deterred others from challenging the peace that they achieved by demonstrating their ability to enforce it. This is why Natsumi and Sasuke worked so well with each other to preserve peace. Natsumi worked in front of public eyes, using her diplomacy and charisma to make alliances, spread her ideals, and appeal to the populace. Sasuke worked behind the scenes as the Shadow Hokage, and took care of threats to peace before they became too much of an issue. After they died, the future leaders took to Natsumi's ideals as well, and I started continuing Sasuke's work to maintain peace, Naruto replied. It seems like the word, genius, still fits you well Naruto. I have never met such a profound thinker before. Hagoromo said with a smile. Hagoromo felt that Naruto truly deserved to be the next sage of six paths. However, Hagoromo needed Naruto to do something for him. Anyways, Hagoromo, I find it hard to believe that this is a social visit from you. What exactly are you here for? Naruto asked. Someone like the sage of six paths would not visit people for a simple, friendly chat. The last time someone was visited by him was during the Fourth Great Shinobi War, during which Natsumi and Sasuke received his power to defeat Naruto. I see you have hit the nail on the head, Naruto. Indeed, I do require something of you. You see the Shinto deities are not the only pantheon that exists in the world, Naruto. They have simply sealed themselves into their own dimension due to the fact that they were tired of the constant rivalries between deities of other pantheons, Hagoromo said. This is quite interesting information, Hagoromo, but what does this have to do with me? Naruto asked. I am getting to that. The thing is, you are truly not from this world. While you were born here, your birth occurred due to a rather silly mishap by the Shinigami of this world. Long ago, when I was battling my mother, Kagaya, sealing her in the moon caused the seal between the other dimension and the elemental nations to weaken slightly. Coincidentally, the Greek god of the underworld, Hades, was making a trip to Erebus, the darkest part of the underworld besides Tartarus. Hagoromo said, pausing as he saw slight confusion on Naruto's face. I will explain all the references to the Greek pantheon later, after I finish what I am telling you. Anyways, the weakening of the seal caused Hades to accidentally end up in the Shinigami's realm in the form of a lost soul, where he wandered for almost a millennium. The Shinigami, 
who was tired of the monotony of his job of collecting souls, did not notice Hades, and accidentally collected him. Sensing that the soul he collected was not dead, the Shinigami panicked and quickly sealed the soul into a child who was being born at that moment, much to Hades' chagrin. This child turned out to your father, Minato Kagaya. Hades, being new to this experience, was able to separate his power from Minato's, making him have normal Kagaya clan abilities, but he was not able to separate the power from being transferred to you while you were being conceived. This caused your chakra to mutate and become similar to tailed beast chakra, Hagoromo said. So, you were telling me that I am this, Hades, fellow's son? Naruto asked. In a sense, you are. Hades was able to finally control his abilities from inside Minato's soul by the time your parents were conceiving your sister, so while she did have a large amount of raw power and chakra, her chakra paled in comparison to yours. So, while you were genetically Minato's son, as Minato and Hades are different people, Hades' power caused the mutations necessary for you to essentially become a genetic freak. When your father died, Hades' soul was liberated and he was able to go back to his world, Hagoromo said. I see. So, it is Hades who is responsible for my power. I would have never guessed such a thing. All right, so why have you felt the need to tell me this now, after all this time? Naruto asked suspiciously. Hades wants you to go to the other world, where the Greek and the other pantheons reside. Something about preventing a war from breaking out. He was not able to finish as it was taking too much of his energy to communicate with me through the seal between our worlds. Hagoromo said. Hum, so that's how it is. I would have to politely decline though, as I have to remain here to maintain peace in the world that I actually belong to. Naruto said. Naruto, please, think about it. You can leave a blood clone here to take care of things in your absence. People here no longer hold a candle to the power that you possess. The only downside is that you will not be able to communicate with the clone. You going will help form ties between the Greek and Shinto pantheons as well. And don't you want to help another world achieve peace? Hagoromo asked pleadingly. Naruto thought about what Hagoromo said for a moment before sighing and standing up, letting natural energy from his perpetual sage mode flow into his muscles to let them relax and loosen up. You are a master manipulator. Do you know that, Hagoromo? Naruto asked exasperatedly. Hagoromo simply smiled. All right, so can you help me understand the place I am going to, the beings I will have to face, and things like that? As a shinobi it is important for me to get a lay of my land, Naruto said. Before that, Hades also told me to revert you to the age of 12 and get you to enroll in the 6th grade at Yancey Academy, a private boarding school in upstate New York, Hagoromo said. Hum, strange. You seem to forget to mention such important information before. Perhaps I should extract any more information you could be hiding, Naruto said, as both his eyes morphed into the Rinnesharingan. When he implanted Itachi's eyes, which he took from Anko's corpse, into the Rinnegan eyes that he took from Pain, they seemed to mutate together until he saw the six Tomode Rinnegan, like Sasuke's Rinnegan, in both his eyes. These further mutated into the Rinnesharingan after several decades. Hagoromo paled in fear as he saw Naruto's eyes. Shit. No. Naruto. I'm sorry, that's all he told me. I swear. Please don't use those eyes on me. Hagoromo said in panic, calming down once Naruto deactivated his eyes. Thank you. Now, to help you learn about the new world you will be entering, I have arranged some books here for you about Greek mythology, the English language, and other things you will have to learn. Kindly memorize them with your ocular abilities, Hagoromo said. Naruto sighed exasperatedly at Hagoromo's behavior. It perplexes me how you can switch personalities between a terrified brat and a dignified man, that one would expect the sage of six paths to be, so easily. Naruto said as he shook his head. Yes, ahem, now if you would. Hagoromo said, gesturing to the books. You seem to have forgotten to turn me into a twelve-year-old. However, before you do, will I lose any of my abilities after I revert to that age? Naruto asked. Right, sorry for forgetting. You won't lose any of your abilities from this transformation, but you will have to adjust your taijutsu to match your 12-year-old physique," Hagoromo said. Once the transformation was complete, Hagoromo looked at Naruto before smiling. You were a cute kid, Hagoromo said as he reached towards his slightly plumper cheeks. I will pretend I did not hear that, Naruto said, smacking Hagoromo's incoming hands away. You're no fun. Anyways, the books, Naruto, Hagoromo reminded him. Right. 
Naruto said as he memorized the contents of all of the books within a few minutes. Hagoromo beamed proudly once he was done. All right, so can you take me to the new world, or Earth, as it is referred to in the books you gave me now? I wonder why they would name their planet after an element, but I suppose each world has its own quirks. Naruto asked, saying the last part to himself. Um, you see, ahem, yes, Hagoromo started to say as Naruto interrupted him. I am running out of patience here, Hagoromo, Naruto said, his voice having a slight edge to it. Well, my Rinnegan does not have sufficient power to transport someone to that world. Communication is possible, but actual transport needs much more power, Hagoromo said. So, you were saying I should find a way to get there myself? Naruto asked. Finding a way is not a problem. You can simply use a teleportation portal made by your Rinnegan. However, you have to supply it with power until you can get through. Just connect your energy with this hair. It is Hades, so it should take you to him. Hagoromo said. I see. Well then, before I leave, is there anything I need to bring with me, other than my standard sealing equipment and ninja tools? Naruto asked. Ah, yes, thank you for reminding me. All the money you have accumulated throughout the years is useless in this new world, and once you leave, you will not be returning, so I suggest that you distribute it throughout the world and take this money, currency of the place you will be going to. I also suggest that you take your godfather, Jiraiya's literary works with you. Publishing them will earn you some money. Also, take these forged identification documents I have prepared for you so that you do not get into trouble with the law enforcement where you are going, Hagoromo said. It seems there is no world that can escape from perversion. Naruto thought as he sighed and rubbed his temples. All right Hagoromo, I will be leaving now. I suppose this is our final goodbye, Naruto said. Goodbye Naruto. I wish you the best, Hagoromo said. Goodbye, Hagoromo. For what it's worth, I still consider it an honor to have been able to meet you, despite the shortness of our meeting. Please take care of this world for me. Naruto said with a smile before he opened a portal with his Rinnesharingan. He looked back at Hagoromo, who nodded at him, before saluting him and walking through the portal. As Naruto exited the portal, he stole a quick glance at his surroundings to notice that he was in a large palace built with what seemed to be obsidian and bronze. A tall and muscular man was sitting on a throne of bones, which had another throne made of flowers and vines next to it. The man's eyes were an intense, pitch black color and glittered like frozen tar but they flared with violet flames. They had a manic glint, not unlike the eyes of a mad scientist, suggesting megalomaniacal tendencies. His skin was pale, almost white, a sign of either albinism, or long-term confinement in darkness. His hair fell to his shoulders, with bangs covering parts of his eyes. He had a short goatee, which completed his insane appearance. His black robes seemed to be threaded with putrid mist, which Naruto was able to identify as people's souls. These were souls of the darkest, most evil people that Naruto ever felt. The man exuded a sense of a mesmerizing, evil charisma, which reminded Naruto of his past sensei, Orochimaru of the Sanin. Identifying this man as the one who requested his presence, Naruto bowed to greet him. Lord Hades, I have arrived as you have requested. Naruto said. So, you will not kneel before me, eh boy? Hades asked in an oily voice. I only give that sort of reverence to those who earn it. You have not yet earned my respect yet, so I will treat you as I treat others," Naruto said. Naruto wondered if Hades was upset with what he told him, as he saw Hades look down for a moment. Ha 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 ha, I like you boy. You are perfectly right in what you said. I wonder how my youngest brother would react if you told him that. He's probably going to have a coronary, ha ha ha, Hades said, laughing raucously. He glanced at Naruto, expecting that he would laugh as well, but Naruto had not reacted. Tough crowd. Hades muttered. You know, you can lighten up, right? You are no longer in your world, where lowering your guard at the slightest can cost you your life. And please call me, father, or, dad, Hades said. Old habits die hard. But how can I refer to you as my father when you only revealed yourself and called for me when you needed me? Naruto asked. Ah, I see. So that's how it is. I'm sorry Naruto, but I previously intended to leave you alone and allow you to live your life and pass away without learning about me. However, I took pity on you, due to the lonely life you had lived after the death of those you loved. I also think that my father is stirring, and he may take advantage of a possible war that may occur between the gods. I have not observed you for most of your life, 
But I can tell that you are powerful Naruto, even though you are hiding most of your power from detection. I will not ask you to reveal your abilities to me until you trust me more, but please make sure that you tone down the amount of power that you allow to be detected. My youngest brother is paranoid, and may see you as a threat otherwise," Hades said. I see, well I will refer to you as my father then. You are correct about me being powerful, and I am not keen on making enemies the moment I set foot on this world, so I will lower the power I exude. Tell me when I have lowered it sufficiently," Naruto said. Hades nodded as Naruto's detectable power started to lower. It continued to lower until it has about the same amount of energy exuded by Percy Jackson. Stop. Hades said suddenly, just as Naruto was releasing less than a thousandth of his power. Right. So Hagoromo told me that you wanted me to go to a private boarding school by the name of Yancey Academy, in upstate New York. Why is that? Naruto asked. I cannot reveal all my reasons just yet, but I implore you to be watchful of a boy there. He goes by the name of Percy Jackson. Hades said. From the way you were warning me, I can infer that this, Percy Jackson, fellow is either a powerful demigod, or a powerful monster," Naruto said. Perceptive. I am impressed. However, I suggest that you get going now. And please do not reveal your interaction with me to anyone. Unfortunately, several demigods live their lives without being claimed by their parent god or goddess, and they become resentful because of this. My youngest brother also does not take too kindly to gods and goddesses interacting with their demigod children. This is because, in the past, gods and goddesses would influence their children so much that they were able to change the tides of events that affected the entire world," Hades said. I see. I will keep our discussion a secret then. Anything else before I leave? Naruto asked. Yes. Just one more thing. Along with changing your age, I wanted Hagoromo to change your hair color to black as well, but the communication was cut off," Hades said. Why does my hair color need to change? Naruto asked. I am not sure how much you know about this world, but hair like yours is not possible to naturally occur. Your name is also Japanese, and all Japanese people naturally have dark hair. If I change your hair color to black, fewer questions will be raised about it," Hades said. I see, so this is a matter of convenience. I do not have much attachment to the appearance of my hair, so I suppose you can change its color," Naruto said as Hades nodded and used his godly abilities to change Naruto's hair color. Wondering about the secrets behind Hades' abilities, Naruto used the Sharingan to analyze his energy. Hmm, so he is using nature energy to change my genetic makeup and make my hair black. Naruto thought, as he observed how Hades used his powers. Right, you are all set now. I shall arrange your transport to the boarding school then, Hades said. No need, I got this covered, Naruto said as his eyes morphed into the Mangekyu Sharingan. Hades watched in amazement as Naruto's body got sucked into his eye, as if the eye was a black hole. It seems that kid is going to be full of surprises, Hades muttered to himself. As Naruto exited his Kamui dimension, he saw that the place he was at was highly urbanized, with several vehicles of all shapes and sizes traveling on a large network of roads. Several skyscrapers were neatly organized throughout the terrain. Hum. It seems that these people have solved the issue of insufficient living spaces by stacking homes on top of each other. Impressive, Naruto thought. However, Naruto was quite appalled by the lack of nature in this world. Nature energy was present in the same quantities as the elemental nations, but it felt tainted. Naruto decided to fix this by traveling to the most polluted places every day, and using his magnet release abilities to cleanse the air of pollutants. Naruto also decided to go to all the world's deserts, and use his wood release abilities to repopulate them with trees. Naruto walked around, observing the shops, restaurants, hospitals, and other businesses that came into his view. It seemed that any abilities that were out of the ordinary were not used in this world, or at least, not in public. Naruto idly wondered how the hospitals in this world were able to operate, when the doctors were not chakra users, or users of any type of energy for that matter. However, he decided to do what was required of him first, that is, find Yancey Academy. Naruto pulled out several maps of different parts of New York State, which were among the documents given to him by Hagoromo. He quickly used his Sharingan to memorize their contents before disposing them off in the trash. Naruto then walked into an alleyway, checked to see that he was alone, and used Kamui to teleport to Yancey Academy. He noticed that Yancey was quite well constructed, with lush pine trees surrounding it. He used the earth release, hidden stone jutsu to camouflage himself, 
as he walked inside and observed his future peers. He noticed that most seemed to come from wealthy families, but their treatment of each other showed that they were not entirely of the right mindset. Naruto walked back outside and undid his camouflage. He then went to the admissions office and paid the admission fee to enroll the sixth grade. He used subtle genjutsu with his Sharingan to avoid any questions about his parentage, resources, or other things that would make the admissions officers hesitate to allow him to enroll. He also manipulated the officers to put him in the same class as Percy Jackson. As Naruto prepared for his first day, Percy entered his classroom and sighed in frustration as his kleptomaniacal classmate, Nancy Bobofit, began to pester him incessantly. How the hell does she have the energy to start harassing me at 7 in the morning? Percy thought as he shook his head in exasperation. As his English teacher, Mr. Nickel, walked into the class, he clapped to get the student's attention. Good morning class. Settle down, settle down. Today is a very special day, as we have a new student who will be joining us momentarily. Mr. Nickel said. All the students were excited to meet the new joiner, except Percy. Great, another rich snob to get picked on by. He thought, as he rested his chin on his desk. Nancy Bobofit had a glint in her eye at the thought of another person she could torment. Grover was curious, but slightly nervous, to see who the new student would be. They all saw a moderately tall student for their age group, who was around 5 feet 2 inches tall. He had long, spiky jet black hair that was tied in a ponytail. His piercing green eyes had a barely noticeable glow to them, and there were six black whisker marks on his face. He had a Caucasian skin tone, a strong jaw, and a shredded muscular physique, with prominent vascularity visible on his forearms. He wore a black t-shirt with a creepy skull image on it, along with a pair of black jeans and a silver skull necklace. His shoes were also black and rugged looking. And were those steel tips that Percy saw on their soles as the boy walked in? Percy looked around the class and saw that a large number of the girls were giggling to themselves and sporting large blushes on their faces. Even Nancy Bobofit seemed moderately flustered. Percy turned to Grover, who seemed to be shitting his pants and hyperventilating as he looked at the boy. Naruto was using mist to disguise his pointy ears as regular, human-like ears, but as Grover could see through the mist, he was able to notice their real shape. Naruto noticed Grover's reaction and slightly narrowed his eyes at him, but he quickly averted his gaze from him as Mr. Nickel spoke. Well, son, why don't you introduce yourself to your peers? He asked. Of course, my name is Naruto Uzumaki. I like to play sports and practice martial arts. Nice to meet all of you, Naruto said with a small bow. He saw that many of the girls had swooned at his words as he mentally sighed. Fangirls, not again, he thought as he moved to sit beside Percy, as indicated by Mr. Nickel. Hum, so this boy is Percy Jackson. He seems quite unsuspicious and I sense no ill will from him. I suppose appearances can be deceptive, but I still wonder what father was so concerned about when it comes to him. Naruto thought as he took his seat. Whatever it is, I am sure this will be an interesting experience. Naruto concluded as he began to pay attention to Mr. Nicole's monotonous droning. One thing that Naruto noticed about Percy as the class progressed was that none of the people at Yancey Academy, students or faculty, seemed to treat him well. They were not receptive of his issues with dyslexia and ADHD, even though Yancey was supposedly an academy for troubled children. This was especially true when it came to the mathematics teacher, Mrs. Dodds, who would be unnecessarily harsh with Percy. It seemed that this was the reason behind all the resentment that Naruto sensed from Percy. Percy's only friend in the school seemed to be Grover, who smelled like a goat to Naruto's sharp, fox-like sense of smell. Naruto was no fool. He could easily tell that Grover was no ordinary human, and neither was Mrs. Dodds. Grover had a distinct presence that was reminiscent of wood release chakra. Similarly, Mrs. Dodds smelled like a scavenging bird, which Naruto gleaned from the sulfurous and metallic odors of rancid meat that she exuded. Though Naruto was being subtle in making his observations, he was so engrossed that he forgot to interact with his classmates. After Mrs. Dodds mathematics class, in which she solved some linear equations for the class, Percy turned to Naruto. Hello Naruto, my name is Percy. You don't have to be shy about speaking with me, even though you're new here. Would you like to be my friend? Percy asked. Noticing his mistake, Naruto quickly fabricated an excuse. Apologies, Percy, I am not sure how good I am with English yet, as I grew up in a Japanese background. I wanted to get used to this environment first. 
I can be your friend, Naruto said, hoping that the war that Hades spoke of was dealt with quickly. He didn't want to be Percy's friend for too long and end up growing too close to him. He had nothing against Percy, but he did not want to end up outliving another friend. Percy sighed in relief, seeing that Naruto was not a jerk. Seriously dude? Your English is better than most of the people in this class. Possibly myself included, Percy exclaimed. Naruto smiled at him. Thank you, Percy, he said. Oh, boohoo. What a cheesy way to talk, said the annoying voice of one Nancy Bobofit. Yo Naruto, why don't you ditch the loser and come with me? I heard the band room is free for a hot makeout session, Nancy said, giving Naruto a coy smile. Percy could not believe the indecency of this girl. He turned to Naruto to see what he would say, but he was surprised that Naruto had not even reacted. You're not worth my time. From what I have seen so far, Percy is far better and friendlier than an insecure, foul-mouthed, and degrading bitch like you. Naruto said in an even tone, causing the class to chant out, Oh! Roasted! Nancy was red in the face after hearing Naruto's words to her. Shitty asshole! I will teach you a lesson! She screeched as she threw the bits of chalk she had in her hands at Naruto. Naruto's eyes seemed to glint as he caught one of the chalk pieces and threw it in such a way that it ricocheted off of all the others before hitting Nancy, leaving a pinkish mark on the center of her forehead. The entire class was absolutely shocked at this display. WH what the fuck? Nancy exclaimed. From the corner of his eye, Naruto saw that Percy jaw had dropped and his face was making a stupid expression. Naruto's fangirls swooned when they saw what he did, and the boys were animatedly talking about it. Dude! Did you see that? Damn that guy got some skills, and, whoa! That was awesome! Were some comments that Naruto was hearing quite often. Did I really have to do that? Naruto thought as he sighed in exasperation. Meanwhile, the next teacher arrived to teach his class on a wheelchair. This was the Latin teacher, Mr. Brunner. As Naruto observed Percy's expression, he concluded that this was one of the teachers that Percy actually liked, possibly the only teacher he liked. However, Naruto noticed that this teacher was not a normal human as well. As he discreetly used his Sharingan to analyze Mr. Brunner's energy signature, he saw that there was energy coming from inside the wheelchair, which was definitely abnormal. Mr. Brunner also had a distinct smell that reminded Naruto of stables. Naruto was doubtful that a handicapped man, like Mr. Brunner portrayed himself to be, would be able to do the physical labor necessary to tend to horses, so he was likely to be a Greek creature. His emphasis on Greek mythology was another red flag. After classes had finished, all the students returned to their dorms. Many were looking for Naruto, wanting to ask him to teach them cool tricks like what he performed in school on Nancy Bobofit. Girls wanted to ask him out on dates, however, it seemed that Naruto had disappeared. Percy also wanted to ask him about the chalk incident but was disappointed to see that his friend had left without even saying goodbye. Naruto was in his dorm, brainstorming on the possible identities of Grover, Mrs. Dodds, and Mr. Brunner. It was easy to guess that Grover was a satyr, due to his goat-like smell and nature-like aura. Mrs. Dodds was difficult to place. It was clear that she was concealing her features, and Naruto was cursing himself for not using his Sharingan to analyze her energy signature. However, he remembered her smell which was similar to scavenging birds. Naruto remembered that the only creatures that would fit this description would be furies and harpies. Harpies tend to be very unintelligent, hardly capable of teaching a mathematics class. This left furies as the only possible category of creatures Mrs. Dodds could be. Naruto was slightly annoyed with Hades for not trusting his ability to watch Percy and making Percy's life miserable with such an unfair teacher. Naruto felt a large amount of malicious intent directed at Percy from Mrs. Dodds, so he decided to keep a watchful eye over her and her actions using his sensory abilities. The only person left to identify was Mr. Brunner. Naruto instantly knew that Mr. Brunner was a centaur. However, Mr. Brunner did not fit the description for what he read about centaurs, as they were known to be literal party animals with little sense of responsibility. Hum, the only centaur I read about, who is similar to Mr. Brunner is, Oh my is he really still alive? Naruto questioned, realizing that Mr. Brunner was actually the legendary Chiron, the trainer of heroes. At this point, the door to his dorm room was opened by a weary Percy. Percy walked into the room to see Naruto lying shirtless on his bed, deep in thought. Percy gasped in shock as he saw Naruto's shredded physique, wondering what Naruto did that was able to make him so built. 
Dude! How are you so ripped? You were twelve for God's sake! Percy exclaimed. And what are you doing in my room? How did you get here anyway? Percy asked. Easy, Percy. I was assigned as your roommate. Sorry for not telling you. Naruto said, as he stood up and put his shirt back on. What? I did not ask for a roommate, Percy said. Naruto shrugged. If it bothers you so much, I can ask them to reassign me, he said nonchalantly. What? No, no, it's all right. It's just, never mind, Percy said. He was hesitant to get close to Naruto, as he was nervous about him finding out about the abnormal things that would happen around him. He did not want his new friend to think of him as a freak. However, Percy had a feeling that there was more to Naruto as well. Percy had never heard of a 12 year old being as well built as Naruto. The amount of calculation involved in the chalk incident was also something that ordinary people cannot do. After re evaluating his mysterious friend and roommate, he decided that Naruto was the most likely person to accept him as a friend, along with all the abnormalities he was surrounded by. Yancey Academy had organized a field trip to the Metropolitan Museum of Art for all the students the next day. It turned out that Percy was quite excited for this, as the museum guide was none other than Mr. Brunner himself. The class would be learning about Greek mythology from Mr. Brunner. Naruto showed no outward reaction to the announcement of the field trip, which slightly annoyed Percy. For some reason, Naruto seemed to never show much emotion. Someone could make the funniest joke and he wouldn't laugh, or try to piss him off in every way possible and he wouldn't snarl or sneer, or do the kindest thing for him and he wouldn't smile. Percy sometimes wondered what happened to make Naruto like this. Any expression Naruto did make would never seem genuine. On the day of the field trip, Mr. Brunner guided the students through big, echoey galleries, past marble statues, and glass cases full of ancient black and orange pottery. Percy gawked at the items displayed in awe, amazed that these artifacts managed to survive for millennia. As Mr. Brunner explained about Greek funeral art, Nancy Bobofit snickered something about the naked statue on the steel. Will you shut up? Percy demanded, annoyed with Nancy's antics. Unfortunately for him, this came out louder than he expected, and was heard by the entire class. Mr. Jackson, did you have a comment? asked Mr. Brunner politely. No, sir, Percy replied, his face red with embarrassment. Turning to a painting on the display, Mr. Brunner asked Percy what the painting depicted. Relieved that it was something he recognized, Percy promptly answered, that's Kronos eating his kids, right? he asked. And perhaps Mr. Uzumaki can tell us the reasons behind his actions? Mr. Brunner suggested. Either way, he continued his practices with his children until his sixth child, Zeus, was born. The fool failed to realize that his wife had swapped the child for a rock of a similar shape and size, and Zeus was able to grow and train away from Olympus. He then infiltrated his father's palace and deceived him into ejecting his siblings from his stomach which for some reason had not digested them yet. They all were then able to overthrow Kronos and the remaining titans, seizing control of Olympus, Naruto said. After hearing Naruto's answer, the class had burst into laughter, but Mr. Brunner had a terrified expression on his face. Nothing good could come of insulting the titan lord, despite the fact that Naruto spoke the truth. Meanwhile, Nancy Bobofit made a comment. Like we're gonna use this in real life. Like it's gonna say on our job applications, Please explain why Kronos ate his kids, Nancy said. And why, Mr. Jackson, to paraphrase Ms. Bobofit's excellent question, does this matter in real life? Mr. Brunner asked. Busted. Grover muttered. Shut up. Nancy hissed, her face a brighter red than her hair. Percy was happy that Nancy was singled out by Mr. Brunner, but he still had no idea how to answer the question. I don't know, sir, he said. I see. Mr. Brunner said, with slight disappointment in his tone. Perhaps Mr. Uzumaki can answer my question, then? Mr. Brunner asked. Naruto's eyes glinted in mirth despite his lack of facial expression as he responded. Well, Mr. C, I suppose if we were to ever meet these beings in real life, it would be rude to not know of their history, wouldn't you agree? Naruto answered evenly, shocking Mr. Brunner and causing the class to laugh uproariously. Mr. Uzumaki. Please refer to me by my correct name, Mr. Brunner. You called me, Mr. C, when you were giving your answer. Mr. Brunner said, slightly weary of Naruto. Did I now? Hum, I suppose I slipped up a little. Perhaps I should do some horse riding to freshen my mind a little. 
Well, it is time for lunch now. See you around, Mr. C, Naruto said nonchalantly as he left the museum doors. Mr. Brunner was panicking now. Beyond a shadow of doubt, Naruto was aware of his true identity. He began to retrace his footsteps. Surely, he must have done something that had tipped Naruto off about who he really was. He was never aware of Naruto's existence until a day ago, and there seemed to be so much mystery surrounding that boy. However, whoever Naruto was, there was no denying that he was dangerous. Mr. Brunner would have to tread carefully from now on. Naruto's actions terrified Grover as well, who was able to glean that Naruto knew of Shiron's identity already. Naruto was definitely a powerful person, creature, or whatever he was. He was about as powerful as Percy, or maybe even more so. Naruto's pointed ears, eyes with vertical slits for pupils, whiskers, claws, and abnormally long and sharp canines were not helping Grover dismiss him either. The abnormal presence of nature energy present around Naruto was overpowered out by his aura of death that he inherited from Hades, as he did not want to draw out nature spirits. This was another reason why Grover could not accurately judge Naruto. If Naruto was not exuding his aura of death, Grover would possibly try to stay as close as possible to the being that was most similar to Lord Pan. Grover silently lamented how he was always sent on the most difficult demigod retrieval missions, like seriously, two children of the big three, and now life had to throw him into another shitty situation. Grover did not like how Naruto was becoming friendlier with Percy as of late, not out of jealousy, but out of concern for Percy's safety. How could Grover even attempt to tell Percy not to be friends with someone who had not done anything to harm him? Worst case scenario, this action could remind Percy of how people would alienate him from socializing, and create a strain in their friendship. This would make Naruto a closer friend to Percy, and would put Percy in more danger. Grover could not have that, so he decided to simply watch Naruto and Percy more closely from now on. However, the fact that Naruto was friendly with Percy, and stood up for him multiple times, showed that his intentions were possibly innocent. Most Greek creatures would make it known that they have malicious intentions by antagonizing the demigods they target. Naruto was not like that, meaning he was either trying to cunningly manipulate a powerful demigod like Percy, or that he was not a threat to him. Grover's money was on the former. He knew that his opinions on Naruto's intentions were entirely based on his appearances, and as the old saying goes, you cannot judge a book by its cover, however, it was better to be careful than to ignore Naruto and cause Percy to die, or worse, turn evil. Grover was not going to fail another retrieval mission. Not only did he know that if this were to happen, the Council of Cloven Elders would be likely to forbid him from achieving his lifelong dream of becoming a searcher for Lord Pan, but Grover truly cared about both Percy and Talia, and he wouldn't be able to live with his guilt if Percy were to die as well. Grover knew that the only way to watch Naruto closely was to find a way to be his friend, like Percy. This was necessary, because if Grover's suspicions of Naruto trying to manipulate Percy made Naruto a much more deadly adversary than any antagonistic monster. With this in mind, Grover decided to steal himself and approach Naruto, who was sitting alone on the rim of the fountain and staring at the clouds. Percy was still looking for Naruto at another location, so Grover took his opportunity. Hello Naruto. How come you are here all by yourself? Are you not going to eat? Grover asked. I'm not hungry, Grover, but thank you for your concern, Naruto said. Grover frowned at this. I just wanted to know, why were you not calling Mr. Brunner by his correct name? Grover asked. I think we both know of Shiron's identity, don't we, Seder? Naruto asked emotionlessly, shocking Grover that his cover was blown as well. Well, I, Grover started to say, hoping to salvage any shreds of secrecy that remained in his mission. Don't bother. From your earlier reaction, I was able to see that I guessed right. I would simply like to know why you seem to so keenly observe Percy Jackson, as though you were a disguised bodyguard. While you do seem quite timid to be a bodyguard, that could always be a facade. Naruto said, his eyes boring deeply into Grover's very own soul. Grover was formulating a suitable response, when he was fortunately saved by the arrival of Percy. Hey guys, what's up? What are you two doing here? Aren't you hungry? Why didn't you invite me along? Percy questioned rapidly. I just needed to be alone for some time to think of some things, Percy. And I am not that hungry, so I thought I would catch up with you later, Naruto said. Say, why did you tease Mr. Brunner like that, Naruto? He's a good teacher, please be nice to him, Percy said. I wasn't teasing him, Percy. 
Naruto started, before seeing Grover's pleading look, which silently told him that Grover did not want Shiron's identity being revealed to Percy. Naruto sighed before continuing. Mr. C was one of my favorite past instructors, Percy, but he passed away, so I have a few bouts of PTSD from time to time. Nothing to worry about. Naruto lied smoothly. What is Grover doing here talking to you? Percy asked indignantly, insecure that his friends may outcast him. Sensing this from Percy, Naruto answered calmly. No need to worry about it, Percy. Grover was simply fascinated by the satyrs that Mr. Brunner was studying about, and wanted to learn more about them. As a vegetarian, he identifies with them quite well, so he approached me to ask about them. As for why he didn't come to you, I don't think you are quite as familiar with Greek mythology as me, do you Percy? Naruto said, once again lying through his teeth. Grover was quite nervous about the subtle hints about his species that Naruto gave Percy, but Naruto's ability to lie so easily reinforced Grover's feeling that Naruto could be manipulating Percy. I see. How come you are so familiar with Greek mythology, Naruto? Aren't you Japanese? Percy asked. Mixed race. As you can see, my eyes are green. Anyway, I don't think you are Greek, but you are still interested in their mythology, are you not? I simply spent more time learning about it, that's all. Naruto said. Fair point. So, Percy started to say, but he was interrupted by Nancy throwing bits of her peanut butter sandwich onto Grover's hair. Percy was furious, and he would have slugged Nancy in the gut, chivalry be damned, had Naruto not stopped him. One thing unknown to everyone was that Naruto hated bullies. He knew how their minds worked. Their inferiority complex would make them target others in an attempt to exert dominance on them, in order to feel better about themselves. Naruto hated those who abused weaker people to prove their superiority. Naruto stalked up to Nancy, scaring her slightly. Naruto stopped in front of her before pointing to the bits of her sandwich that Grover had picked out of his hair. Eat them. He said softly. Nancy's mind was racing. Naruto asked her to eat food from the muddy ground. And even worse, it had touched Grover's lice-infested hair. Seeing as Nancy had not moved, Naruto spoke again. Eat them. You wouldn't want to waste food, now, would you? He said as he loomed over her menacingly. Finally, Nancy gained some backbone and steeled her resolve. Why should I? She said defiantly. Unimpressed, Naruto aimed a small amount of killing intent at Nancy. He made sure no one could feel it other than her. Nancy wet herself from seeing visions of herself dying in horrifying ways, from being crucified, to being impaled, to being burned alive. Reeling from the experience, Nancy spoke as sobs came through her eyes and mouth. All right, all right, I will eat them. Please, don't do that again, Nancy said, with tears flowing down her cheeks. She went over to the ground beside Grover and started picking the pieces of her sandwich and eating them. Grover simply observed from the side as she did this, infuriating her. As she ate the last piece, she gave Grover a strong kick to the shin. Percy was seething in rage. It's all right, Percy, I'm fine, Grover said, as he attempted to calm his friend down, but Percy was having none of it. Percy's rage turned to shock when a tendril of water extended from the fountain, and pushed Nancy to the ground. Nancy got up and ran to Mrs. Dodds, who conveniently was in quite close proximity to Percy, Naruto, and Grover. Mrs. Dodds, Percy pushed me, she complained. Did he, now? I suppose that is grounds for punishment. Mrs. Dodds said as she walked towards the group. Percy wanted to dispute what Nancy said, but doing so in the presence Mrs. Dodds was figuratively suicide. So, he simply resigned himself to whatever punishment he would be given. Now, honey, I would like you to come with me, Mrs. Dodds said venomously. I know, a month of erasing notebooks, I know, Percy said lackadaisically. Now honey, Mrs. Dodds replied. Panicking, Grover pushed Percy out of the way and took the blame. Wait, no, it was me, I pushed her, he said. You, Will, stay, here, Mrs. Dodds hissed, as Grover looked to Percy and Naruto desperately. Don't worry, Grover. I will help him, Naruto said. Percy gave Nancy an I'll kill you later glare, but she simply smirked. As she led him up the stairs in the museum, Percy saw Grover's eyes flitting from Mr. Brunner to him, as if wanting Mr. Brunner to see what was happening. Percy would have observed more, had Mrs. Dodds moved a little slower, rather than at inhuman speeds, as they moved deeper into the museum.
she stopped only after reaching the Greek and Roman section of the museum. However, for some reason, the gallery was devoid of anyone except Percy and Mrs. Dodds. You've been giving us problems, honey. Mrs. Dodds said, confusing Percy. Sure, he was not exactly a model student, but why was he being singled out? He usually would keep to himself as well, not attempting to pick fights. Of course, he would stand up for himself and Grover when they were bullied, both by teachers and peers, but that surely shouldn't amount to him being problematic. And yes, he would cheat on his assignments a few times, but who didn't? His illegal candy stash also would not attract this type of response from a teacher, unless Mrs. Dodds had some unresolved traumatic experience that involved her candy. However, Percy decided to play it safe. Yes, ma'am, he said evenly, hoping she would be diplomatic. However, it seemed luck was not on his side. Did you really think you could get away with it? Mrs. Dodds asked, with a malicious look in her eye. Terrified, but hoping that she would do the right thing as a teacher and not harm him, Percy managed to get out a shaky response. I'll try H harder ma'am, he said fearfully. We are not fools, Percy Jackson. It was only a matter of time before we found you out. Confess, and you shall suffer less pain. Mrs. Dodds said menacingly. Percy seriously had no clue what this was about. He mentally replayed everything he remembered doing while at Yancey Academy, but found nothing that would elicit such a response from Mrs. Dodds. Well? Mrs. Dodds pressed further. Ma'am, I don't, Percy started to say, but Mrs. Dodds' features started to shift. Your time is up. She hissed venomously. Her eyes started to glow like hot coals, her fingers elongated into talons, and her jacket morphed into large, feathery wings. The shriveled hag with bat wings, claws, and a mouthful of sharp, yellow teeth charged at Percy, intent on killing him. Percy heard someone, presumably Mr. Brunner from the sound of his voice, shout out. What ho, Mr. Brunner started to shout. However, he was interrupted by a screeching noise that sounded like several thousands of birds chirping all at once. Despite the way he described it, the sound was quite unpleasant to his ears. Just as Mrs. Dodds was about to pounce on Percy, a lightning construct emerged through the left side of her chest. Mrs. Dodds turned around, trying to see her assailant, as Naruto's face came into view. You! Mrs. Dodds gurgled out. Me! Naruto replied calmly, as he retracted his chidori from her chest cavity. Mrs. Dodds let out a silent wail as she burst into golden dust. However, somehow, Naruto remained pristine, without a speck of dust on him or his clothes. Mr. Brunner watched the display so stunned that he dropped the pen he was about to throw to Percy. Percy was also in awe when he saw Naruto's power. Dude what the hell was that? Percy asked incredulously. I will explain later. First, let us get out of here. Naruto said, as he grabbed Percy's shoulder and used a body flicker to teleport him to an isolated area. As Percy gained his bearings, he looked around to see that he was surrounded by trees. Whoa! How did you do that Naruto? Percy asked in awe of Naruto's abilities. Naruto turned to Percy as he looked him in the eyes with his Mangekyu Sharingan. All right, now that we are away from prying eyes, Sukuyomi, Naruto said as the world around them dissolved. Percy's eyes opened in a red and black landscape, slightly fearful of what Naruto was doing, but not acting on his fear yet. After all, Naruto did save his life. There had to be some meaning behind that, right? Welcome to my realm of Sukuyomi. Here, I have all control over space, time, and senses. I have slowed down time here so that one second in the outside world is 72 hours in here. You may ask any questions you have freely, and I will answer as I see fit. Whatever I do answer, I will tell you the truth. I may withhold some information from you until I trust you more, but I will not lie," Naruto said. Cool. That is such an interesting ability, Percy thought excitedly, before remembering that he had questions to ask. What exactly are you? Percy asked. I cannot give you the exact answer you are looking for yet, but I can tell you that I am the same species as you. I am not some monster in hiding like Mrs. Dodds. Speaking of her, don't bother mentioning her once we get back with the others. She has a method to alter the memories of others, so our classmates are unlikely to remember her, Naruto said. Percy nodded, though he was not satisfied with Naruto's answer. Why do we remember Mrs. Dodds? Percy asked. We are both special cases. I'm sorry, but once again, I cannot say more on this," Naruto said. Oh, so like, because we fought her? Percy asked. 
Something like that. Naruto said calmly, causing Percy to nod. What are those abilities you used? Percy asked. Percy. I am a type of warrior known as a shinobi we train from childhood to master arts like ninjutsu, genjutsu, and taijutsu. Ninjutsu is what you just witnessed. Me using the lightning blade, teleporting us here, things like that. They require my source of energy, which is called chakra, to perform. Genjutsu is the art of making illusions. It is reliant on the yin, or spiritual, aspect of chakra, in order to create form out of nothing. Taijutsu is straight up physical fighting. It is reliant on the yang, or physical aspect of chakra, in order to fill the fighter with vitality, speed, endurance, and strength. Naruto said. Whoa, so you must be super strong then, huh? Percy asked. I suppose so. You were taking this information quite well. I was expecting you to shout that you don't believe in things like this, or some nonsense like that. Naruto said. I don't think much can surprise me after the Mrs. Dodds incident. Except if Nancy Bobofit proclaimed her love for Grover. I am sure the world would end if that happened. Percy said, causing Naruto to crack a small smile. Is that all? Naruto asked. No, wait. You said we are the same species, right? So can I learn to your abilities and use them to fight? Percy asked. I am not too sure about that, but I won't say it is impossible. Naruto said, genuinely curious as to whether Percy could learn his abilities. One last thing. What was Mrs. Dodds? Percy asked. That is something I cannot tell you yet, Percy. Besides, I have a feeling that you will find out yourself soon enough. Naruto said, inwardly smirking at Percy's pout. Percy confirmed that his questions were answered for now, so Naruto brought the both of them out of the Tsukuyomi realm. Before you leave, there is something I must do, Naruto said. Percy was about to ask what, before Naruto made a few rapid one-handed hand signs. Was that supposed to do something? Percy asked, but was shocked when he heard Naruto's voice in his mind. We are now mentally connected. If we are separate, but one of us has to tell the other something, we can communicate through this link. Naruto's voice said. Wait, now you can hear my thoughts? Percy asked, not liking the invasion of privacy. Only the ones you choose to share with me. It will be useful if you are ever in danger again. And simply think what you want to tell me in your head. You don't have to physically talk to me. Naruto's voice said. Percy nodded as he understood. One more thing. Naruto said, as he made a few more one handed hand signs, and curled his hand around Percy's wrist, creating a seal. This will allow me to find you whenever you are in danger. Naruto said in Percy's mind, causing the boy to nod in gratitude. What branch of the shinobi arts are these drawings from? Percy's voice asked curiously. They are actually letters, as you can see from closer inspection. They come from a branch of ninjutsu, known as fuinjutsu, or sealing techniques. Naruto's voice replied. All right, Percy, let's join the rest of our class. We have been away from them for long enough. Naruto said normally, not through the mind-binding technique he used on Percy, as Percy grumbled, but followed along. This was going to be a long year. I hope Mrs. Kerr whooped your butt, called the annoying voice of Nancy Bobofit. Hmm, so it seems Naruto was right. Mrs. Dodds must have manipulated something to make everyone forget about her and replace herself with this, Mrs. Kerr, person. Percy thought. Knock it off, Boba Fett, he yelled. Don't call me that. Nancy yelled back. Percy wondered why she was wearing different pants than she was before, but he remembered how Naruto scared her enough to make her wet herself. He grew a sly smirk, happy to gain some ammunition against her. He wouldn't use it now, of course, but he would definitely embarrass her in front of the whole class when the time was right. Oh, sweet, sweet vengeance. Chiron and Grover were wondering why Percy did not make a fuss about people not remembering Mrs. Dodds. But Chiron remembered how Naruto talked to Percy before bringing him back. Yes, he would have to watch out for this Naruto character. Such a powerful person could not have appeared so suddenly. While Grover did not know about Naruto saving Percy, he saw them walking back together, so he also made the assumption that they talked about what happened. Although Naruto's energy signature was somewhat reminiscent of a demigod, Greek monsters attempting to mimic their signature was not unheard of. The inhuman features Naruto possessed were not helping the situation either. Chiron was unwilling to take action against Naruto on the off chance that he actually was a demigod, but he was going to take extra precautions against him. Throughout the rest of the trip, 
Percy was weirded out by how everyone acted as if Mrs. Dodds never existed, even when he added Mrs. Dodds references to some of the things he said. They seemed to think Mrs. Kerr, a perky blonde woman, had been their pre-algebra teacher since Christmas. Naruto gave him a look that said, I told you so. And Percy just shook his head in exasperation before turning to Grover. Interestingly, Grover did not seem to be completely in agreement with the rest of the class, as he was sending nervous glances to both Percy and Naruto. Percy mentally smirked as he leaned closer to Grover's ear. You remember Mrs. Dodds, don't you, Grover? He whispered, causing Grover to jump and yelp in anxiety. Any problems, Grover? Mr. Brunner asked pleasantly. And no, I'm f fine. Grover said as he gulped and took in a few deep breaths to calm himself. Grover turned to awaiting Percy to reply. What do you mean? Our P pre algebra T teacher is Mrs. K. Kerr, Grover said nervously. You're a bad liar, Grover. Your ears turn pink and you stutter a lot more when you do, Percy said, which caused Grover's ears to turn pinker than they already were in embarrassment. Look, I'll explain later, okay? I promise. It's just, um, it's not safe to discuss this right now, Grover said. Percy mentally spoke to Naruto through the seal. Any ideas? He asked. Not my place to say, but I think you can figure it out yourself. You are smarter than you give yourself credit for, Naruto said, making Percy beam at the praise. Percy hadn't noticed before, but New York was experiencing some very odd weather ever since Christmas. Blacker clouds than he had ever seen formed, thunder would clap as well every so often, storms were brewing, and so on. At first, he thought it must be global warming or something, but sometimes the weather would fluctuate too much for it to be caused naturally. Snowstorms, floods, wildfires, and lightning strikes would all occur within the span of a few days. The bizarre weather continued as the year-end tests approached. Disasters like tornadoes were a frequent occurrence, planes would end up being inexplicably swallowed up by the Atlantic Ocean, and thunderstorms would occur every day. Yet, for some inexplicable reason, Yancey refused to cancel the tests, which slightly vexed Percy. Percy became cranky and irritable due to nightmares about Mrs. Dodds, and the only thing that kept his grades at the range of B's was Naruto's help. When he was unable to spell words during the spelling test due to his dyslexia, Naruto controlled his body through the seal and wrote the answers for him, something Percy didn't know he could do, but was immensely grateful for. When Percy surprisingly scored well on that test, Naruto deliberately messed up a few words so that it wouldn't seem suspicious, the English teacher Mr. Nickel accused him of cheating, which he did, and Percy called him an old sot. He didn't know what the term meant, but he liked how it sounded. Naruto was angry that Mr. Nickel treated Percy like this. He did admittedly cheat, but it was undetectable, and Percy should have been seen as the one responsible for his own scores. However, Mr. Nickel was never willing to be accommodative of Percy's dyslexia, and Naruto had the impression that Mr. Nickel loved setting up Percy to fail. That day, Percy's mother was sent a letter from the headmaster telling her that Percy would not be invited to Yancey Academy for the next academic year. Percy was so annoyed by this that he stopped caring about Yancey completely. He had hit his threshold when it came to how much he could take before rage quitting. His homesickness was not helping matters either. Other than his expulsion from yet another school, his teachers and peers, other than Mr. Brunner, Grover, and Naruto, were complete jerks, he had discovered that the reality he had known was a lie, and that horrible monsters and people with amazing abilities existed in this world. His life was such a roller coaster of events that it almost felt as if he was part of some fantasy series. What was next? Was he going to suddenly find out that he is the son of some Greek god or something? Percy just wanted to return home and be with his mother on the Upper East Side, even though that would include having to deal with his obnoxious stepfather, or smelly Gabe as Percy called him. Perhaps he could tell his mother that he made another new friend in Naruto, and bring Naruto to his home for a while someday. Yet, Percy could not deny some of the better aspects of Yancey that he would miss when he returned. The view of the woods from his dorm window, the Hudson River in the distance, and the ever-present, fresh smell of pine trees were some of the things that he had very much appreciated about Yancey. He was not sure whether he would see Naruto, Grover, or Mr. Brunner again either. Naruto and Grover were Percy's only friends in Yancey Academy. While he had only known Naruto for a few weeks, and Naruto did not have a very welcoming aura, Percy felt that they were quite close friends. Percy was not quite as close with Naruto as he was with Grover, but Percy started to resent Grover slightly for keeping things from him. 
Naruto was doing so as well, but Percy had been friends with Grover for much longer than with Naruto. Also, Naruto had been perfectly clear that he would be hiding some things from Percy, and this clarity was something that Grover did not give Percy. Percy did trust Grover, but he decided to be a little cautious with him. He knew what to expect from Naruto, at least as far as his interactions with him go, but he could not say the same for Grover after the Mrs. Dodds incident. Mr. Brunner was another case. Percy did see him come to the location where Mrs. Dodds had confronted him. He also heard Mr. Brunner shout, What ho! as he was about to throw something. After Naruto had stabbed his hand through Mrs. Dodd's heart, Percy saw him drop a bronze pen. Percy could not tell why, but his instincts were telling him that it was no ordinary pen. Percy suspected Mr. Brunner much more than Grover. He could tell when Grover was lying to him, but Mr. Brunner had a calculative aura, which screamed to Percy that he could keep information hidden, and lie undetectably. Whenever he stared at Mr. Brunner's eyes, he would see that they held an ancient wisdom that normal people wouldn't possess. However, Percy still knew that he enjoyed the times Grover spent with him in Mr. Brunner's lectures in Latin class, and he would miss them regardless of their intentions. He was snapped out of his thoughts when Naruto appeared in the dorm with a book on mythology. Well, shall we start preparing for the Latin test, then? He asked. Peefed, yeah right. You never prepared for tests, Percy said. I have an eidetic memory. Naruto said. How come you are so lucky? Now you can add, eidetic memory, to your list of P, Percy said, as Naruto interrupted him with a glare. Right. Wasn't supposed to mention that, ehehe. Percy said as he laughed nervously. Just make sure you keep your mouth shut about that. Naruto said, causing Percy to nod. They quickly began studying, well, Percy was studying while Naruto was helping him out. R. How the hell am I supposed to differentiate between Chiron and Karen? or polydicts and polyduces. This is a nightmare. Percy said as he threw the book against the wall and clutched his head in anxiety. For starters, Chiron is a horseman hybrid known as a centaur, and was a trainer of heroes, but Karen is a paid escort for dead souls. Naruto casually commented. Gah, fine, know it all. Can't you do something to transfer your knowledge to me or help me learn better? Percy asked hopefully. I can but I thought Mr. Brunner was your favorite teacher and you wanted to impress him with your own merits. Naruto countered. TCH. Fine, I guess you were right. It won't kill me to put a little effort onto this. Percy sighed. That's the spirit. If you want, I am sure Mr. Brunner would be happy to resolve any of your questions. He has seemed to take a liking to you, after all. Naruto said. Nonsense, but yeah, let's go to him. Percy said. Wait. Why'd I have to accompany you? Naruto asked. So that I don't look like a bumbling idiot. I never asked a teacher for help before. Percy said brusquely, causing Naruto to shrug and accompany him. Neither spoke a word on their way to Mr. Brunner's office, but as they approached the room, whose door was ajar, they heard voices speaking inside. They recognized Grover and Mr. Brunner's voices, and Naruto's sensory abilities confirmed their identities. Worried about Percy, sir. Especially since he is with that Naruto fellow. He might be in danger. Grover's voice said, causing Percy to freeze, as his face contorted in anger. He did not appreciate the fact that Grover was cowardly enough to dump his suspicions about Naruto onto Mr. Brunner. The fact that Grover and Mr. Brunner seemed to be in cahoots with each other for some secret operation they were doing did not help Percy's trust in either of them. Alone this summer. I mean, a kindly one at school. Now that we know for sure, and they know too, Grover continued, before Mr. Brunner seemed to interrupt him. We would only make matters worse by rushing him. We need the boy to mature more, Mr. Brunner said. Oh, so Mr. Brunner was playing these manipulation games behind his back? Percy's trust in both Grover and Mr. Brunner shattered at that moment. He was going to pretend being friends with Grover, as he didn't know what consequences would befall him if he were to reveal that he had eavesdropped. However, he was not going to trust Grover and Mr. Brunner any longer. But he may not have time. The summer solstice deadline is, he heard Grover start to say anxiously, before being abruptly interrupted once more by Mr. Brunner. We'll have to be resolved without him, Grover. Let him enjoy his ignorance while he still can, Mr. Brunner said. Still, he saw her, Grover said unsurely. His imagination. The mist over the students and staff should convince him of that. Mr. Brunner said with a dismissive wave. Percy clenched his fists in anger. 
he could not believe that his life was being manipulated behind his back by his best friend and his favorite teacher. The level of betrayal he was feeling was insane, however, a hand was placed on his shoulder and his mind suddenly calmed down. Percy looked back at Naruto incredulously as he removed his hand from his shoulder. Percy would definitely ask him about that. They both continued to listen as Grover spoke. Sir, I, I can't fail in my duties again. Grover whimpered. You haven't failed, Grover. I should have seen her for what she was. Now, let's just worry about keeping Percy alive until, Mr. Brunner started to say before hearing a loud thud. Percy's mythology book had fallen from his hands as he heard this. Naruto made no move to try to catch it, as he was engrossed in the conversation. Percy was wondering how these people could be so cruel as to control whether he lived or died. Were they just keeping him alive to wait for the right moment to kill him? Like a pig for slaughter. Percy's heart hammered as Naruto grabbed both him and the book and body flickered back to the dorms. A soft clacking against the floor echoed through the halls, as Chiron opened the door to peek outside. Nothing. It seems my nerves haven't been right since the winter solstice. Chiron muttered softly. Mine neither, sir, but I could have sworn, Grover said. Go back to the dorm, Grover. You've got a long day of exams tomorrow, Chiron said. Don't remind me, Grover replied exasperatedly. Neither of you will be going until you tell me why you are manipulating Percy's life behind his back. They both heard a voice say. It was a partially developed adolescent voice, but it was dominating. They turned to see a stoic Naruto leveling an even glare on them as his hand were folded against his chest. You, Grover said furiously to Naruto. Who do you think you are, messing around with Percy? What are you? You mean to say you haven't been manipulating him either? And I am the same as Percy is, a demigod. Percy lost all his trust in you both after hearing you conversation today, Naruto said. What? He eavesdropped on us. Sir we must fix this. Percy may be in danger if he tries to isolate himself from us, Grover said. Oh, and what exactly have you both been doing to protect him? Hiding his identity from him? Allowing him to remain a weakling? You cannot babysit him forever, Naruto said. But he is, Chiron started to say, before Naruto cut him off. But he is what, Chiron? A child who should remain ignorant while questioning if he has schizophrenia? You expected him to fight off one of the Lord of the Dead servants for his first ever combat experience. Yes, I did notice you try to throw him an enchanted weapon, which you somehow expected him to know how to use. If you are trying to protect him, you are certainly not fit for the job. Naruto said harshly, causing Chiron to bow in shame. It was hard to argue with Naruto when he put it that way. All right, Naruto, I admit, I have been rather careless in my approach to protecting him. But how can I be sure that you have his best intentions at heart as well? Chiron asked. You can't. You just have to trust me based on my previous actions. Plus, I am a demigod. One of the members of the population you used to be fond of training, Naruto said, surprising Chiron and Grover, as Naruto wisely admitted that he cannot claim to be trustworthy without getting the chance to build the trust between himself and Mr. Brunner. All right, Naruto. I will place my faith in you for now. Protecting Percy would be your job now. Please ensure that your actions say that I chose well. Chiron said, causing Naruto to nod. All right then. Good night, Chiron, Grover. Naruto said, nodding at the two of them. Chiron and Grover watched as Naruto's body melted into several small, black foxes that quickly scampered away. Chiron gave a low whistle at this display. That is some kid, he said incredulously. Couldn't agree more, sir, Grover said. So, you're telling me that Mr. Brunner and Grover were trying to protect me from something? Percy asked suspiciously, causing Naruto to nod. Percy let out an exasperated sigh, as he tiredly rubbed his temples. And I suppose you won't be telling me why yet? Percy asked, causing Naruto to nod once more. Why make me wait? Percy asked. Mr. Brunner and Grover don't want you to put yourself in danger with the mess of events that have been taking place lately. However, you can trust that as long as you are with me, you are in safe hands," Naruto said confidently. No, Naruto. You don't understand. Do you know how weak and pathetic I feel when I have to rely on you for protection? I won't accept you and the others hiding stuff from me anymore," Percy said angrily. Well then, how about I teach you? I can give you rudimentary training to help you protect yourself," Naruto said, 
causing Percy to give a slow smile. I accept. I suppose I have to call you, Sensei, now or something, Percy said. That would be customary, but currently unnecessary. Your training begins tomorrow, after our Latin test. Meet me in our dormitory at 2 p.m., after you eat lunch. Make sure you eat well, as you will be needing the energy, Naruto said, causing Percy to narrow his eyes suspiciously. Speaking of eating, or drinking, sleeping, or going to the bathroom for that matter, how come I have never seen you do that? Percy asked. All in good time, now, rest up, or you won't do well tomorrow. Both in our training session and in the test, Naruto said, giving him a pat on his shoulder. Percy nodded as he went to bed. Naruto waited for Percy to fall asleep. When he finally did, which was signified by the thumping sound of his heartbeat significantly lowering in volume, Naruto activated his Mangekyo Sharingan and warped into the Kamui dimension to train, as he did every night. He was not keen on slacking off and becoming weaker. Once he entered the dimension, he quickly created a darkness clone. When Naruto was in his late teens, he was facing a block in the development of his abilities. He meditated to enlighten himself regarding why this was happening, and found a dark and pessimistic version of himself, trapped and unable to get over its own grievances. He had known for a long time that you cannot have a light side without the dark side and vice versa. Naruto immediately accepted his darkness as a part of him, and took advantage of the fact that his dark version had the same abilities as him. Every time he trained, Naruto would spar with his dark version, by manifesting it into something he referred to as a darkness clone. Every time he would think of a way to outmaneuver the clone, the clone would also try its best to trick him. This would allow both Naruto and his darkness to become stronger, causing the training to be twice as effective as usual. Naruto jumped back as his darkness clone rapidly fell towards him, with one leg raised up as it shouted, Heavenly Foot of Pain. The darkness clone's foot came crashing on the floor as several cracks and fissures made their way towards Naruto. Naruto had reinforced his Kamui dimension to handle Tsunade's super strength technique, and Naruto was quite satisfied to see that his darkness clone was able to crack it. Naruto shot towards his darkness clone with a lava release, Rosin Shuriken in his hand. As the darkness clone put its hands together in a snake hand seal and said, Wood release, deep forest emergence, a massive sea of gigantic trees rapidly expanded towards Naruto. Naruto threw the lava release, Rosin Shuriken, which was enhanced by his perpetual sage mode, towards the mass of trees as it cleaved through them like they were butter at first. However, the sheer number of them were overwhelming, and the lava release, Rosin Shuriken slowly diminished in size until it vanished. However, Naruto was not allowed to watch this happen, as his darkness clone appeared right behind him with his hand covered in bones, which twisted together to form a sharp point at the end of the fist. Dance of the Camellia. Flower. The clone called as it pierced through Naruto's body, only to feel no resistance as Naruto thought, Haifujin, and dissociated into the air. The darkness clone rolled as it fell back to the ground, but it quickly reacted with a dance of the larch, as its ribcage expanded to block the reformed Naruto's incoming Chidori. The darkness clone put its hands on the floor as it called out, Dance of the Asphodel. Creation, several skeletal creatures, like dinosaurs, dragons, mammoths, and saber-toothed tigers crawled out of the floor as they moved to fight Naruto. All killing ash bones, Naruto said, as four gray bones flew out of his palms towards the skeletal creatures, killing two saber-toothed tigers and one mammoth. Naruto turned as his darkness clone appeared behind him with a truth-seeking Rosin Shuriken. Almighty push! Naruto yelled, sending his darkness clone flying towards a wall. The darkness clone flipped as it used chakra to land on its feet. However, it did not have time to react to Naruto's ice release, hail of unbreakable icicles, which were flying towards him at ungodly speeds. Suzano, it thought, as a jet black armor surrounded its arm. It was forced to put much more chakra into the construct as a few icicles actually cracked the Suzano's armor at first. Naruto quickly appeared behind the darkness clone, as he held up a one handed bird hand seal. Wind release tamed winds, he thought as the darkness clone sensed several blades of wind rapidly approaching him. Dance of the oak, the darkness clone thought as its entire skeleton expanded into a massive construct that was similar in size to the Suzano. Naruto smiled as he did the same. The darkness clone smiled as well, as it covered the massive skeleton with a perfect Suzano. Naruto did so as well, as he made his entire structure put its hands together in a horse hand seal. Blaze release. 
Amaterasu's infernal annihilation, Naruto called, as a massive sea of Amaterasu flames advanced towards the Darkness Clone. The Darkness Clone quickly activated the Rinnegan and thought, prayed a path, as it absorbed all of the flames. Naruto and the Darkness Clone continued to fight and train like this throughout the night, until around 6 am the next morning. Naruto exited the Kamui dimension, as he waited on his bed for Percy to wake up. Naruto turned towards Percy as he moved in his sleep. Naruto sighed as he moved towards him. Wake up, Naruto said, as he lightly slapped Percy's cheeks a few times. MMPH, five more minutes. Percy mumbled. Naruto sighed again, as he thought, water release. Freezing tides, sprinkling about a cup of ice cold water onto Percy's face. Percy violently gasped as he shot up, causing Naruto to lean back slightly, in order to avoid being head butted on the nose. What the fuck, man? Why do you feel the need to do that every single day, bastard? Percy yelled, as he wiped off some of the icy water off his face. A. N. If you all are wondering how Percy got wet, he wasn't even aware that he wasn't a normal human in canon until he arrived at Camp Half Blood. I think his abilities to stay dry in water, heal in water, and control water only manifested when he was experiencing extreme emotions before Poseidon claimed him. He would have likely noticed it if he was able to stay dry in rain, while washing his hands, or something like that. Get dressed. We have the test to finish. We have to begin your training later. Naruto said tersely, tossing a set of clothes towards him, which Percy caught after fumbling a little. Hum, must work on his reaction time. Naruto absently muttered. What was that? Percy asked, and Naruto simply shook his head. Nothing you have to be concerned about. Let's go, he said as he turned and walked away. He's such an asshole in the morning. Fucking hard ass. Percy muttered in frustration, before he quickly got dressed. Percy felt quite good after finishing the test, as Naruto helped him with the spellings through their mental link. The answers were all Percy's though. Percy figured he would get a decent B plus or A, so he wasn't too worried. However, as he was about to leave the classroom with Naruto, Mr. Brunner called him back in. Percy, don't be discouraged about leaving Yancey. It's, it's for the best. He said in a quiet and kind tone, but the words still embarrassed Percy, as the other kids finishing the test were able to hear Mr. Brunner. Nancy Bobofit smirked at him and sarcastically clicked her tongue while shaking her head. Okay, sir. Percy mumbled, unsure how to feel about Mr. Brunner saying such a thing. I mean, this isn't the right place for you. It was only a matter of time. Mr. Brunner said slowly, as if he was trying to choose his words carefully. Percy's eyes stung as he pulled himself together. After claiming to believe in him the whole year, his favorite teacher was now saying, in front of the whole class, that Percy was destined to get expelled from Yancey Academy all along. Right. Percy said shakily, trembling as he felt betrayed. No, no. Oh, confound it all. What I'm trying to say, you're not normal, Percy. That's nothing to be, Mr. Brunner started to say, but Percy cut him off. Thanks. He blurted out. Thanks a lot, sir, for reminding me, he finished. Percy, Mr. Brunner started to say, but Percy had already turned on his heel and left the room. Mr. Brunner turned to Naruto, who narrowed his eyes at him. You need to learn to think before you speak, Mr. Brunner. Naruto said, before he left as well. Mr. Brunner sighed in his wheelchair and shifted his attention to the students who were still writing the test. Naruto quickly caught up to Percy, who had an angry expression on his face. Leave me alone, Naruto. I need some time to myself. Percy said briskly. Naruto put a hand on his shoulder, and Percy instantly calmed down and was able to think clearly. How the hell are you doing that? Percy asked in amazement. I am allowing Senjutsu Chakra to flow through your body. This energy is the embodiment of balance and clarity, and these are what it brings you. Naruto said through the mental connection. Percy nodded at this explanation, as well as the implicit reminder to not talk so openly about Naruto's abilities. I'm sorry, I just have a lot on my mind, with what Mr. Brunner said, Percy said. You know, you shouldn't be taking what he said at face value. It was clear that he was not able to phrase what he actually wanted to say to you correctly, not without revealing information he is trying to keep from you, Naruto said. This caused Percy to think about his current feelings. You don't think it's connected to what he was saying about protecting me, do you? Percy asked. Oh, yes, without a doubt. However, don't bring that up when conversing with him until he is ready to tell you himself. 
Naruto said sagely. Now, I believe we have some training to do. Naruto said, focusing his intense gaze on Percy, causing the son of Poseidon to gulp nervously. Naruto led Percy to a secure area, as he held his arm and warped him to the Kamui dimension, which had automatically repaired itself since Naruto's spar during the night. W what is this place? Why have you brought me here? Percy asked nervously. Another one out of my arsenal of techniques. This is called, Kamui, a pocket dimension from the real world. I can freely manipulate the space within this dimension, but the time passes in here at the same rate as the real world, Naruto said. That is amazing. How do you do that? Percy said in awe. A story for another time. Now, on to your training. I have taken the liberty to prepare a regimen for you to follow, in order to physically keep up with what I will teach you. However, I would first like to do an initial check of your physical abilities, in order to ensure that I made the correct assumptions, Naruto said. All right, Naruto. What do I have to do? Percy asked. Well, first you will be tested in your upper, core, and lower body strength by seeing how many weighted push-ups, pull-ups, and squats you can perform. The weight you will be carrying will be equal to half of your own. Then, your speed and endurance will be tested by seeing how long you can keep up your maximum speed, until your speed reduces by one mile per hour, and how fast you complete a five mile run. After that, I will test your reaction speed by aiming punches at you at faster and faster speeds until you can no longer dodge. For now, until you learn to fight properly, I will consider it a proper reaction if you either dodge my attacks, Naruto said. That sounds like a whole lot, I mean, I don't know if I will have the energy for it. Percy said unsurely. Worry about that later. First, get to the push ups. I will be counting, Naruto said. Yeah, fine, you don't have to be such a hard ass Naruto, Percy said, causing Naruto to narrow his eyes. Do you want training or not? Naruto asked. Sorry, I will get to it, Percy said hurriedly, causing Naruto to shake his head in exasperation. Naruto quickly planted a gravity seal onto the back of Percy's next, causing him to feel around 50 pounds heavier. Percy quickly took his position on the ground and started the drills. After 20 minutes Naruto looked at the results. Hum. 22 weighted push-ups, 29 weighted pull-ups, and 36 weighted squats, not bad for someone who has never trained before. All right, I will remove the weight now. Naruto said, as he released the gravity seal by making a tiger hand seal. All right Percy, get to your runs. First, the maximum speed run. Naruto said, using the mystical palm technique to bring Percy back to shape, which Percy was amazed by at first, but he didn't question it as he had grown used to Naruto's abilities. After Percy had finished both runs, Naruto was happy with the results. You are doing well so far. Your top speed was 25 miles per hour, which you maintained for 821 feet before finally reaching 24 miles per hour. In the 5 mile run, your average speed was 12 miles per hour. Now, all that is left to test is your reaction time, Naruto said. Percy nodded and got into what Naruto assumed was his fighting stance. It was clear the boy had never participated in combat in his life. We have to improve your stance later, but first, the test, Naruto stated, causing Percy to get slightly embarrassed. The first few punches Naruto threw at Percy were traveling at the speed of demonstration punches, which Percy dodged and intercepted with ease. Slowly, the punches became faster until they could compare in speed to a street brawler's punches. Percy was still able to react to them on time, albeit with a lot more effort. Naruto the upped his punching speed to that of an amateur martial artist. At this point, Percy found it extremely difficult to keep up, and he even let a few punches within his guard. At this point, Naruto stopped the test. Very nice, your reaction time is also quite good, seeing this is the first time you are training. Now, Practice these fighting stances and movements that are depicted on this scroll I made for you. I will be demonstrating each one, of course, but it is up to you to practice them," Naruto said. But how do you know that this style is good for me? Percy asked. Very simple. All shinobi who start their careers first enter the shinobi academy of their respective hidden village. They are taught this fighting style as a starting point something they can add their own twists and changes to as they gain more experience and understand how their bodies prefer to move. In other words, it is adaptable, and by learning it, you will be able to improve it as you practice to suit your own needs," Naruto said. But you said you will be deciding a suitable regimen based on my abilities that you observe, so shouldn't you know what style would suit me? 
Percy asked. You're right. I do have a few styles in mind for you, but it is still too early to tell which would be the most optimal. Learn the academy style and spar with me a few times so that I can decide on the best one. Naruto said, leaving no room for discussion or negotiation. From that day on, Percy had been training himself to the ground daily, recovering with the help of Naruto's medical techniques and abilities. A few weeks later, the last semester at Yancey Academy had finally ended, and everyone was returning to their homes. Percy felt some jealousy when he overheard some of his rich classmates talking about amazing vacations their parents had planned, but he knew that with Naruto's help, he would become a lot more intelligent, powerful, and confidant, which he was happy about. Percy also realized that with his training, he was not spending as much time as before with Grover, which made him feel slightly guilty. Of course, he still slightly resented Grover for hiding things from him, but he wasn't going to abandon his friend. He felt even more guilty, since he realized that he would have to say, goodbye, to Grover, but it seemed he didn't have to, as he boarded the same Greyhound to Manhattan as Percy did. During the whole bus ride, Grover kept glancing nervously down the aisle, watching the other passengers. Percy remembered how Grover would always act nervous and fidgety when he and Percy left Yancey, as if Grover expected something bad to happen. Before, Percy had always assumed he was worried about getting teased, but there was nobody to tease Grover on the Greyhound. Finally, Percy could not stand Grover's behavior anymore. Looking for kindly ones? Percy blurted out in frustration. W what do you mean? Grover asked. No need to lie to him Grover, don't insult his intelligence. Hide something from him if you wish, but at least tell him you are doing so. And do not lie to him. Your friendship is already hanging by a thread since Percy overheard your conversation with Mr. Brunner. Do you want to risk straining it more? Naruto asked. Grover trembled as he shook his head. How much did you hear? He asked Percy anxiously. Not much. What is this summer solstice deadline you and Mr. Brunner were discussing? Percy asked nonchalantly. Grover froze before he replied. Look Percy, I was really worried about you, you see, hallucinating, Grover said before Naruto cut him off. Grover, Naruto said with a warning glare. Grover's ears turned pink as he replied. Just take this, okay. In case you need me this summer. Grover said. The card was in fancy script, which was murder on Percy's dyslexic eyes, but he finally made out something like. Grover Underwood Keeper Half Blood Hill Long Island, New York. 800, 009. 0009. What's half? Percy started to say, but Grover cut him off. Don't say it aloud. He yelped. That's my, um, summer address. Grover said as he fidgeted his thumbs. Okay. Percy said glumly, slightly miffed that Grover was as rich as many of his fellow students at Yancey. So, like, if I want to visit your mansion? Percy asked. Grover nodded. Or, or if you need me. Grover said slowly. Why would I need you? Percy asked, a little harsher than he meant to. Naruto cuffed Percy on the head. Think before you speak, Percy. You were being rude to your friend. He reprimanded, as Percy mumbled out an apology to Grover. No, no, it's fine Naruto. He needs me in case I need to protect him. It's my job. Grover said. Percy was shocked at this, and even Naruto was amused by the irony. There was not a single instance either had seen where Grover showed any capability of protecting Percy. I see, and how will you do that, especially while posing as a disabled person? Naruto asked. Grover's ears turned pink again. Um, you see, I am not very strong among my kinsmen, so I don't have many techniques, Grover said quietly. All right, that is fine, but say a kindly one, as you call them, were to appear on this bus, which is very much possible as it already took place in Yancey Academy. How would you neutralize the threat? Naruto asked. Um, well, I comma I don't know. Grover said miserably as his shoulders slumped down. This is why I told you and Mr. Brunner that you can leave the responsibility of protecting Percy to me, as I have proven that I am more than capable. I know it is your job, but to do a job well, you need to have the required skill sets, which you currently do not possess. I am sorry to put it so harshly, but it is the truth. I am inclined to believe that even Percy here would be challenging, or even impossible for you to defeat as you are right now," Naruto said. Hey, lay off on him Naruto, he's a nice guy," Percy said. All right then, Percy, tell me. Will Grover being nice protect you from kindly ones? Naruto asked. Well, 
No but, Percy started to say as Naruto cut him off. It was a rhetorical question. Being nice is just a trait that helps you with diplomacy. If Grover being nice would protect you, I would be perfectly fine with the situation. I am sorry Percy, but I have to say it like it is. I don't sugarcoat things, as it makes it seem as if they are not as bad as they are. Right now, Grover is hardly equipped to protect even himself. He cannot worry about protecting you. Naruto said harshly, causing Grover to shrink further, as he knew whatever Naruto was saying was correct. Percy knew this as well, as he bowed down his head and refused to meet Grover's eyes. Now, that isn't to say that you can't become stronger, but you have to be aware of what you are capable of right now, and not recklessly gallivant into situations you cannot handle. Do you understand me, Grover? Naruto asked. Grover hesitantly nodded as he replied. I get it Naruto. I will train myself to become more suited for combat, Grover said, causing Naruto to nod appreciatively. As the bus continued onto the countryside, the three of them noticed an old-fashioned fruit stand on the side of the road opposite to their own. The goods on sale looked delicious. There were heaping boxes of blood-red cherries and apples, high-quality walnuts and bright, orange apricots, jugs of fresh apple cider in a claw-foot tub full of glistening ice cubes. There were only three old ladies sitting in rocking chairs in the shade of a maple tree, knitting the biggest pair of socks they had ever seen. The socks were the size of sweaters, but they were clearly socks. The lady on the right knitted one of them. The lady on the left knitted the other. The lady in the middle held an enormous basket of electric blue yarn. All three women looked ancient, with pale faces wrinkled like fruit leather, silver hair tied back in white bandanas, bony arms sticking out of bleached cotton dresses. The strangest thing was that rather than focusing their attention on the socks they were knitting, the women's attention was focused on Percy. Each of the three ex Yancey students had different thoughts running through their minds. Grover. Oh fuck this can't be happening right now. Shit. 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 Percy. This is not what I envisioned when I wanted more attention from girls. Naruto. Hum. Naruto instantly recognized the women selling fruit as the fates in Greek mythology. The string they were using to knit the socks seemed to be imbued with the same type of, albeit weaker, energy signature that Naruto sensed from an Uchiha using a Zanagi. So that's how they wrote reality. The fates had a dangerous weapon that only he could counter with his own Izanagi. Naruto swore to never use that jutsu again, as he hated manipulating reality. It infuriated him that these women were doing so. As Grover panicked, Naruto used Haifujin to instantly appear next to the fates, who were confused by his action. Kamui. Naruto muttered as he sucked all of them, including himself, into the Kamui dimension. The fates looked at Naruto angrily. How dare you strong arm us, foolish demigod. We will show you your place, Clotho said, as she rapidly began stitching. Unaffected, Naruto simply activated his Rinnesharingen. Azanagi. He said, as what they were stitching instantly vanished. Using Amaterasu, Naruto quickly burned the fates, thread. Furiously, the fates charged at Naruto with celestial bronze clubs. Naruto simply made three shadow clones, who restrained the women within the blink of an eye, causing them to widen their eyes in fear. Pray to path. Otsutsuki variant, they all muttered, keeping the Rinnesharing inactive. The fates all began to panic, realizing that their energy was being drained from them at an alarming rate, several times faster than they could replenish. They were terrified of what this boy could do to them. Soon enough, they appeared to be three normal old women, and they were shocked when Naruto slit one of their fingers with a bone knife of sorts, and red blood seeped out instead of golden ichor. Why are why you doing this to you us, Atropos weakly asked. No one should manipulate reality from the shadows, Naruto said. P please, spare our lives, they all yelled. No, you are responsible for the deaths of several people who did not deserve such a fate with no real reason for such an action. You deserve death, Naruto said. He shut all three of the fates up by using his Rinnesharingen to trap them in a genjutsu. They all quickly slumped, awake, but no longer conscious. Now, to ensure my father doesn't find your souls, Naruto said as he opened a coffin in his Kamui dimension to find a Zetsu that he had preserved. He slapped a ceiling tag onto it, summoning Jutsu. Impure world. Reincarnation, Naruto called, as the Zetsu sank into the ground, and in its place emerged a coffin. 
It opened to reveal Minato Kagaya, Naruto's father. Naruto stuck a kanai with a sealing array into the back of Minato's head. Before Minato could gain any intelligence, Naruto quickly enforced his orders. Shadow Clone Jutsu. Minato said, as two shadow clones appeared beside him. Minato did several hand seals, as he called, Hyunjutsu, Reaper Death Seal. The Shinigami instantly appeared, as he stuck a hand through each shadow clone into the fates. After he sealed their souls, along with the Zetsus, into his stomach, the Shinigami disappeared. Naruto appeared next to Percy and Grover from the Kamui dimension. What did you? Grover started to ask, but Naruto activated his Sharingan, and looked into Percy's and Grover's eyes. After a moment, all of his actions were forgotten by them. Naruto watched as both of them fell asleep in their seats. Naruto had manipulated their memories so that they would remember the events how they expected them to progress. A. N. Basically, they remembered the canon version of events that took place. Grover still remembers seeing them cut the string and him and Percy still have that conversation. After the bus ride was over, Percy had ditched Grover, as his friend was freaking him out, looking at him like he was a dead man, muttering, why does this always happen? And, why does it always have to be sixth grade? Whenever he got upset, Grover's bladder would act up, so as soon as Grover told him to wait until he got out of the restroom, Percy got his suitcase, slipped outside, and caught the first taxi uptown. However, he realized he forgot something. Shit, Naruto, Percy thought. As Percy got out of the taxi, he was walking towards his home, hoping Naruto would find him somehow, before he felt a hand on his shoulder. He was about to use what Naruto taught him to defend himself, but as soon as he turned around, he saw that the offending limb belonged to his friend and mentor, Naruto himself. How did you find me? Percy asked curiously. Naruto dismissed him with a wave. Not a very difficult thing to do. Anyway, where are you headed? Naruto asked. Spending time with Percy also had an effect on Naruto as well. Naruto had gotten more accustomed to speaking slightly more casually, like what one would expect of his perceived age. Percy pointed to his apartment. My house. Say, would you like to come along? My mother would love to meet a new friend of mine, Percy said. Secretly, Percy was also hoping Naruto would help him get back at his vile stepfather, Gabe Yuliano. Of course, Percy did still want Naruto to meet his mother, but this was an added benefit. Naruto obviously knew Percy was hiding something from him, but he did not want to pry. Of course, Naruto said as he followed Percy to the house. On the way, Percy told Naruto about his mother's life. Of course, it was nothing compared to a shinobi's life, but it did qualify as quite a difficult life compared to most of the people Naruto had met in this world. Her name was Sally Jackson and she was, in Percy's eyes, the best person in the world. This apparently proved Percy's theory that the best people have the rottenest luck, a sentiment that Naruto could agree with. However, Percy was a little jaded in his opinions. Naruto had seen firsthand that several times, when good people became stronger and faced their challenges, their lives would improve. Of course, this wasn't the case with everyone, but Percy was still not entirely correct in his judgment. Sally's parents had died in a plane crash when she was five, and she was raised by an uncle who didn't care much about her. She wanted to be a novelist, so she spent high school working to save enough money for a college with a good creative writing program. Then her uncle got cancer, and she had to quit school her senior year to take care of him. After he died, she was left with no money, no family, and no diploma. The way Percy describes Sally reminded Naruto of his own mother, Kashina, or at least how she was before forcing Naruto to kill her, which caused Naruto to develop a melancholic feeling. Percy then started talking about his father, and Naruto could feel a slight resentment in his tone. Percy did not have any memories of him, just a warm glow, maybe the barest trace of his smile. Sally was apparently tight-lipped about him due to the sadness thoughts about him brow her. There were no pictures either, as the relationship was illegitimate and secret. Apparently, he had set sail across the Atlantic on some important journey, and he had never returned. His mother phrased it very well, in saying that he was, lost at sea. Not dead, but lost at sea. She was very kind, as she worked very hard to make ends meet and raise Percy single-handedly. 
she did this without complaining or neglecting him, despite him not being easy to raise. For some reason that neither Percy nor Naruto could figure out, she married a disgusting excuse of a man known as Gabe Yuliano, who Percy humorously nicknamed as, Smelly Gabe. Naruto also found it quite amusing that Gabe Yuliano's name reflected the type of person he was, ugly Yuliano, had Percy not noticed this connection. The pair walked into Percy's apartment, with Percy hoping his mother would be home from work. Instead, the two came home to an extra stinky smelly Gabe, who was smoking cigars and playing cards his poker buddies, in the living room. Chips and beer cans were strewn all over the carpet. Who's the runt with you? Gabe grunted, hardly looking up. He is not a runt. He's my friend, Naruto. Percy shot back. If you say so, Gabe shrugged. You got any cash? He asked. No, Percy replied. You took a taxi from the bus station. Probably paid with a twenty. Got six, seven bucks in change. Somebody expects to live under this roof, he ought to carry his own weight. Am I right, Eddie? Gabe said, surprising Naruto by doing some Naro level analysis. It seemed that when money was involved, Gabe suddenly Shikamaru's level in intelligence. Eddie, the super of the apartment building, looked at Percy with a twinge of sympathy. Come on, Gabe, the kid just got here. Eddie said, trying to dissuade Gabe. Am I right? Gabe repeated, a little more threateningly. Eddie scowled into his bowl of pretzels, as the other two men passed gas in harmony. Naruto instantly did not like Gabe, but he refrained on commenting on his behavior for now. Percy looked pleadingly at Naruto, causing him to coldly turn his head away, disappointed in Percy. Fine, I said with a scowl, slightly hurt by Naruto's betrayal. I dug a wad of dollars out of my pocket and threw the money on the table. I hope you lose. Percy added before storming to his room. Percy paused on the way to his room. He did not understand why Naruto did not stand up for him. However, he knew Naruto had a reason for everything he did. He decided he would at least wait for Naruto's explanation. Naruto followed Percy to his room as they both took a seat. Percy glared at Naruto for a moment. Why didn't you stick up for me? I thought we were friends, he blurted out. You expect me to fight your fights for you. Remember Percy, I am not some commodity you can use to frighten and fight back against those who wrong you. Otherwise, our training has been a waste, Naruto admonished. Percy looked down sadly for a moment, his friend's words ringing true in his ears. I am sorry Naruto, a part of my intentions when I brought you here was to have you show Gabe his place. Percy said before looking at Naruto. You saw right through me, huh? I guess I should have expected that. Percy chuckled, which Naruto was inwardly happy about, as this boy was able to understand that Naruto's actions were for Percy's own betterment. At that moment, Percy heard his mother call for him as the door opened. Naruto saw how this made all of the negative feelings within Percy vanish, making him crack a small smile. Unfortunately for Percy, he missed one of the only times Naruto actually gave a true smile. The homey warmth the woman exuded was enhanced by the candy fragrances she seemed to emit. Oh, Percy, I can't believe it. You have grown since Christmas, Sally exclaimed as he tightly hugged Percy. She then noticed that Naruto was also sitting there, but she was able to see through his features that were hidden by the mist, as she was a clear-sighted mortal. However, she wasn't one to quickly judge as she awkwardly stepped back from Percy. Oh, I'm so sorry. Are you a friend of my son? She asked. No worries, Ms. Jackson. Yes, I am Percy's friend, and my name is Naruto Uzumaki. Naruto said with a smile, offering her a hand to shake, which she took. However, she couldn't help but notice Naruto's sharp, elongated canines as he smiled to her, as if he was a vampire. Percy. I will need you to step out for a moment, Sally said with some seriousness in her tone. Percy, knowing Naruto could take care of himself just fine, did as told. Naruto, I don't mean to be rude and offend you, but I will be blunt. What are you? Sally asked sternly. No offense taken, Ms. Jackson, I understand you are clear-sighted, Naruto asked, causing Sally to nod hesitantly. Ah, I see the issue then. Fortunately for you and Percy, I am a demigod, just like he is. I have not been claimed yet, and I don't go to Grover's camp, but I am the same species as him. 
My abnormal features only exist because of some circumstances that I don't feel like explaining right now, Naruto said, shocking Sally. You know, she asked, only for a short while. I hope that is all right with you. I won't divulge this to anyone, you have my word, Naruto said, and Sally felt confident, despite the fact that a 12-year-old was making her a promise. Sally only nodded as she called Percy back to the room. What happened, Mom? Percy asked as he walked in. Nothing important. I just warned Naruto to not hurt my cute little son. Sally said, making Percy's cheeks flush in humiliation. Mom, stop that. You're embarrassing me. Percy said, as Sally chuckled and Naruto gazed at the pair with a forlorn expression on his face. Are you alright, dear? Sally asked Naruto, interrupting him from his musings. It's nothing Ms. Jackson. I'll let you be to catch up with Percy for a while. Naruto said as he got up. No, no need, it will actually be better with you here. That way this cheeky boy won't be able to hide anything from me. I need to know if anything strange happened while you two were at Yancey, Sally said, with a sense of urgency in her voice. Percy scowled at the, cheeky boy, comment, before replying. No, not really, Percy said, glancing pleadingly at Naruto. This time, Naruto complied. He understood that Percy did not want to worry his mother, and that was something Naruto respected. You don't have to worry, Ms. Jackson. There was nothing we couldn't take care of. Naruto said confidently, causing Sally to give a relieved nod. She knew Percy was lying, of course, but Naruto was implying that he would protect Percy, which made her feel a lot better. Right, and please call me Sally, Naruto. No need for formalities. Anyways, I have a surprise for you. Percy. We are going to the beach. Sally said. Montauk. Percy asked excitedly. Three nights. Same cabin. Sally said, mirroring Percy's excitement, before she noticed that Naruto was there as well. You can come too, dear. Money will be a little tight, but I am sure we will have a good time. Sally said, not wanting to leave Naruto out. Thank you, Sally. I will come along, but I will pay for myself. I wouldn't want you or Percy to miss out on anything for my sake, Naruto said. Oh, that is, very kind of you, dear. Thank you, are you sure that will be alright, Sally asked. I can manage, Naruto shrugged. If you say so, Naruto, pack up, both of you, we will start as soon as I get changed, Sally said. However, they heard Gabe's voice call from outside. Bean dip, Sally, didn't you hear me? Gabe called lazily. Naruto couldn't stand it anymore. Here was this woman, with no special abilities to help her, doing so much for her son to live happily, and this idiot Gabe was causing her unnecessary stress. Before Sally could respond, Naruto burst out into the living room and used his Sharingan to place Gabe's buddies in a genjutsu, causing them to fall asleep. Naruto easily picked up Gabe by grabbing his neck with one hand and pinning him to the wall. This shocked Sally who came running out of Percy's room along with her son. Fool, can you not see how hard your wife works? Without contributing to the household, how dare you demand her to do something for you? Naruto said, sharing and spinning in cold fury. Naruto, what are you doing? You said I have to fight my own fights, Percy shouted. That applies to you, not your mother. She has enough on her plate already, without this sorry excuse of a man trampling on her efforts. I will not stand for such cruelty, Naruto said firmly. Ak, s she was just. Ah, a trophy wife, that's it. You act l like I should, kkh, care about her, Gabe struggled out. And let go of me, bastard, Gabe yelled as he struggled in Naruto's vice-like grip. Naruto was seething at Gabe's words. You are a perversion of life, Yuliano, ah, how well the name fits such a vile creature as you. There are few people I bestow this punishment on. You should consider yourself honored. Sukuyomi. Naruto said, making Gabe experience three weeks of torture within three seconds. Gabe let out an unearthly shriek as Naruto released him and let him fall to the floor. Gabe was now looking at him with bloodshot and watery eyes, as hot tears streamed down his face. Stop, please. I promise to treat her well, he wailed. You are beyond saving, filthy mongrel. Amaterasu. Naruto said coldly, 
causing black flames to appear on Gabe's body, which made him scream as he was burned alive, leaving behind nothing. Not even ashes. Percy knew that Naruto had special abilities, but what he had seen blew Percy's estimate of Naruto's power out of the water. Sally, on the other hand, was terrified. Why you killed? She started to say. I did, and I am sorry you had to see that. There are some twisted leeches in this world who take advantage of good people like you. And the only solution to get rid of these leeches is extermination. Naruto aid darkly, causing Percy to sigh. Mom, I need to have a word with you about this. Is it all right if she knows, Naruto? Percy asked his friend. Go ahead. Just make sure she keeps it a secret, Naruto said. Percy took his mother to his room, before letting out an exasperated sigh and explaining Sally about what he knew of Naruto's past as a shinobi. Needless to say, the woman was shocked. Naruto had been killing for the sake of his village since the age of seven, an age at which when Percy was still using coloring books and frolicking around the house. So, you see, mom, Naruto grew up in a very different type of society than ours and he kills what he sees as evil, Percy said. But still, Percy, killing is also evil, Sally said. Wrong. Killing someone innocent or redeemable is evil. Killing people like Gabe is a different story. Think of it as weeding a field of crops in order to protect your crop's yield, Percy said, causing Sally to think for a moment. Was she only having trouble with Naruto killing Gabe since he was a human? What about when Percy would have to kill Greek monsters and rogue demigods? She realized her mistake and quickly apologized to both Percy and Naruto for being so quick to judge. By this time, Naruto had already kept the unconscious bodies of Gabe's buddies outside, next to the staircase. All right, let's go for the trip then, Sally said, hopeful to learn more about Naruto and his past. However, that did not let her forget about the real objective of this trip which was to spend quality time with Percy. And Percy, once we get there, you will tell me what you have forgotten to tell me before, okay? Sally asked anxiously, before awkwardly patting Percy on the head. Percy saw through the way she phrased what she said. It was not a request, but a demand. A demand to keep a worried mother well informed. Thankfully, Naruto saved him from responding. I am ready when you are, he told Sally. Um, Naruto. You didn't pack anything, Sally said. No worries, Sally, I have what I need. We can start now, Naruto said calmly. Sally just assumed, quite correctly Naruto would add if someone asked him, that Naruto was using some shinobi ability, possibly the fuinjutsu thing that Percy told her about, to store the clothes. Right, get in the car, both of you, she said, her voice betraying her slight excitement and worry. All three of them entered Gabe's Camaro. As Sally drove towards Montauk. During the car ride, Naruto told Percy through their mental link that he would allow him to lay off on training just for these three days, so that he could spend time with his mother, which Percy was grateful for. As they got closer to the cabin, Naruto saw a quaint wooden house on the beach side, which had quite a rustic charm. The cabin was way out at the tip of Long Island. As they entered, Naruto observed that there was sand in the sheets and spiders in the cabinets. The sea was also too cold to swim in for people who weren't Naruto or did not have the ability to regulate body temperature with chakra. However, Percy seemed to love the place, and Naruto quickly got rid of the sand with his magnet release abilities, and killed all the spiders, in order to make Percy and Sally more comfortable with the arrangements. When Naruto asked Percy why he liked this place so much, Percy described his memories coming to the beach as a child, and how his parents met on this beach. Naruto could certainly see the sentimental value that the place had in Percy's eyes now. At this point, Percy started feasting on the snack and candy samples that his mother got from the shop, which were all blue for some reason. The more and more Naruto interacted with Percy and observed the little things he would do, the surer he became of his father's identity, but he kept it to himself for now. Naruto was broken out of his thoughts when Percy offered him some candy, which he accepted with a nod of thanks. As it got darker, the three made a campfire, with the help of Naruto's wood release and fire release. They roasted hot dogs and marshmallows over the fire as Percy asked Sally about his father. Sally would tell him the same things as usual, but Percy never got tired of hearing them. He was kind, Percy. Tall, handsome, and powerful. 
but gentle, too. You have his black hair, you know, and his green eyes. She said, fishing a blue jelly bean out of her candy bag. I wish he could see you, Percy. He would be so proud. She finished, causing Percy to ponder for a few moments. How old was I? I mean, when he left, Percy asked, as Sally watched the flames. He was only with me for one summer, Percy. Right here at this beach. This cabin. She said. But, he knew me as a baby. Percy said unsurely, though he was quite queasy about spending time in the same cabin in which he was conceived. Percy was not clueless when it came to exactly what baby making entailed, so his mother putting that image in his head made him a little nauseated. No, honey, he knew I was expecting a baby, but he never saw you. He had to leave before you were born. Sally confirmed, causing Percy to nod sadly. What about your family, Naruto? Are you sure they would be all right with you staying away from home for so long? Sally asked, causing Naruto to gain a forlorn expression on his face. They are no longer with me. All of them have died. Naruto said sadly, a rare case of him actually emoting. Percy could not even point out that Naruto had finally shown emotion, as his story was just so sad. Not even Percy had known this about Naruto. It made him feel guilty about telling him about his mother, forcing him to watch as he talked to her and hugged her. Sally was feeling a similar feeling. Stop that now, I don't want you both to pity me. You both have each other as family, so cherish those bonds, but don't look down on others who don't have the same luxury. Naruto said coldly, causing the other two to look at each other sheepishly. I am telling you both of my past, albeit in bits and pieces, as I am slowly starting to trust you. However, I don't seek your sympathy, understand. Just accept it and move on, Naruto said. Sorry, Naruto, but perhaps you have at least one family member, but you don't know yet. Sally suggested, referring to Naruto's Greek godparent. It works a slightly different way with me, Sally. For all intents and purposes, my family is dead, Naruto said. Wait, what do you mean it works in a different way for you, Percy asked. I'll tell you when you are old enough, Naruto said as he patted Percy's shoulder with an amused expression on his face. Shut you, wait, did you, Naruto Uzumaki, just make a joke. What the hell, the world must be breaking apart, Percy said dramatically, causing Naruto to deadpan at him. Is it really so unbelievable that I have a sense of humor, Naruto asked. Both Sally and Percy turned to him and said, yes, simultaneously. Naruto narrowed his eyes at the both of them. H.N. He said as he walked away. Oh no, several months of progress, all gone with a simple, H.N., from Naruto. Oh, woe is me, Percy wailed, as his mother bonked him on the head. Enough of that, drama queen. I think we should spend some time with just us today as well, she said. Percy stared at the fire for a few more seconds before speaking. Are you going to send me away again? To another boarding school, he asked. I don't know, honey, I think, I think we'll have to do something, she said with a heavy tone. Because you don't want me around, Percy asked, instantly regretting the words as soon as they were out. Sally's eyes welled with tears. She took Percy's hand and squeezed it tight. Oh, Percy, no. I, I have to, honey, for your own good, I have to send you away, she said tearfully. Because I'm not normal, Percy asked with a hurt tone. You say that as if it's a bad thing, Percy. But you don't realize how important you are. I thought Yancey Academy would be far enough away. I thought you'd finally be safe. Sally said. Safe from what? Percy retorted, tired of being kept in the dark. As Sally met his eyes, Percy suddenly remembered all the weird, scary things that had ever happened to him, some of which he had tried to forget. During third grade, a man in a black trench coat had stalked him on the playground, which was swiftly dealt with by the teachers, but no one believed Percy when he told them that under the man only had one eye, right in the middle of his head. Before that, when Percy was in preschool, a teacher accidentally put him to a nap in a cot that a snake had slithered into. Sally screamed when she found him playing with a limp, scaly rope he had somehow managed to strangle to death with his meaty toddler hands. In every single school, Something creepy had happened, something unsafe, and Percy was forced to move. 
Percy couldn't make himself tell her about what happened with Mrs. Dodds and the old ladies in the fruit stand. He did not want to abruptly end their trip to Montauk with the news. I've tried to keep you as close to me as I could, but they told me that was a mistake. But there's only one other option, Percy, the place your father wanted to send you. And I just, I just can't stand to do it, Sally said thickly. My father wanted me to go to a special school, Percy asked. Not a school, a summer camp, she said softly. Percy took a few moments to take in the news. I'm sorry, Percy, but I can't talk about it. I, I couldn't send you to that place. It might mean saying goodbye to you for good, she said sadly. For good, but if it's only a summer camp, Percy thought, but he saw that Sally turned toward the fire, and he knew from her expression that if he asked her any more questions she would start to cry. That night, Percy had a vivid dream. It was storming on the beach, and a white horse and a golden eagle were trying to kill each other at the edge of the surf. As they fought, the ground rumbled, and a monstrous voice chuckled somewhere beneath the earth, goading the animals to fight harder. Percy ran toward them to stop them from killing each other, but he was running in slow motion. He saw that he was too late, as the eagle dove down, its beak aimed at the horse's wide eyes. Percy screamed as he woke with a start. Outside the cabin, a massive hurricane was approaching the surf as it stormed heavily on the beach. Sally had sprung out of bed in her nightgown, throwing open the lock. Percy saw Grover standing in the doorway, but he did not exactly look like Grover. Searching all night, what were you thinking? Grover yelled. Sally looked at Percy in horror. Percy, what happened in school? What didn't you tell me? She shouted over the sound of the rain. Percy froze looking at Grover's goat legs and hooves, unable to process what he was seeing. Ozu kai aloi theo i, Grover cursed in ancient Greek. It's right behind me, didn't you tell her? Grover yelled at Percy, who was too shocked to register that he had understood Grover's cursing perfectly. It meant, O Zeus and the other gods. Sally looked at Percy sternly and talked in a tone she'd never used before. Percy, tell me now, she yelled. Percy stammered something about the old ladies at the fruit stand, and Mrs. Dodds, and Sally stared at him, her face deathly pale in the flashes of lightning. She grabbed her purse, tossed Percy his rain jacket, and said, get to the car. Both of you, go, where is Naruto? Right here. Naruto said calmly, his chakra increasing the volume of his speech. Sally was stunned as she saw him appear, seemingly out of the shadows, and stand next to her son. Sally would need some time to get used to Naruto's abilities. Right, you get to the car as well, Sally shouted. As they got in the car, Percy spoke to Naruto through their mental connection. Hey, man, why aren't you using your teleportation ability to get us out of here, Percy asked. Too boring, Naruto replied simply, causing Percy to sweat drop. Seriously, you would jeopardize our safety for the sake of the trip being entertaining enough. Percy deadpanned. Yes, Naruto replied without hesitating, making Percy question his friend's sanity. As Sally drove, Percy had some questions for Grover. So, you and my mom, know each other? He asked, unable to tear his eyes from the barnyard animal legs Grover sported. Not exactly, I mean, we've never met in person. But she knew I was watching you, you know, keeping tabs on you, making sure you were okay, that kind of stuff. But I wasn't faking being your friend. I am your friend, Grover said, adding the last part hastily. Um, what are you, exactly, Percy asked. Grover wanted to dodge the question, but he knew Naruto would tell Percy the answer anyway. A satyr, half man and half goat, Grover said. Whoa, wait, satyrs, you mean like, Mr. Brunner's myths, Percy asked. Were those old ladies at the fruit stand a myth, Percy? Was Mrs. Dodds a myth? Grover retorted. So you admit there was a Mrs. Dodds? Percy yelled. Of course. Grover said calmly. Then why? Percy asked before Grover interrupted him. The less you knew, the fewer monsters you'd attract. Grover said, like that should be perfectly obvious. We put mist over the human's eyes to prevent them from seeing such beings. We hoped you'd think the kindly one was a hallucination. But it was no good. You started to realize who you are, Grover said. Who I? Wait a minute, what do you mean, 
Percy asked. What was he, the son of a god or something? Whatever was chasing the car was still on its trail. Percy, there's too much to explain and not enough time. We have to get you to safety, Sally said. Safety from what? Who's after me? Percy asked. Oh, nobody much. Just the Lord of the Dead and a few of his bloodthirstiest minions, Grover said, causing Naruto to narrow his eyes slightly. He was going to have a word with his father later. Grover, Sally yelled, sorry, Mrs. Jackson, could you drive faster, please, Grover pleaded. Sally made a hard left, racing past darkened farmhouses and wooded hills and pick your own strawberries signs on white picket fences. Where are we going, Percy asked. The summer camp one told you about. The place your father wanted to send you. She said in a tight voice, scared of the possible repercussions of sending Percy to the camp. The place you didn't want me to go, Percy said. It wasn't a question. Don't make this more difficult for her than it needs to be, Percy, Naruto said through their mental link. Percy nodded apologetically. Sally suddenly pulled the wheel to the right, swerving to avoid a dark fluttering shape which they now lost behind them in the storm. What was that? Percy asked. We're almost there. Another mile. Please, please, please. Sally begged, ignoring Percy's question. Naruto sensed a build-up of lightning approaching. He suddenly punched a hole through the roof of the car, and used his lightning nature manipulation ability to redirect the incoming lightning bolt to the beast behind them, narrowly missing as the car jerked violently. Naruto, why would you do that? Sally asked angrily. A lightning bolt was aimed at the car's roof. Naruto replied. Oh, sorry for getting angry at you. Thank you so much for protecting us. Sally said. No problem, but the Minotaur is about to crash into us. Naruto said. However, Sally could not react on time and the Minotaur smashed its meaty head against Grover's side of the car. Naruto covered everyone with a layer of chakra to protect them from the impact but he underestimated the piercing power of the Minotaur's horns, causing one to clunk against Grover's head. This knocked Grover out, and some blood started leaking from his temples. Naruto quickly used Hyphujin to get all of them out of the busted car. It seemed Percy and Sally were relatively uninjured compared to Grover, as Grover was knocked out. Percy had a cut on his lip and Sally had a bruise forming on her elbow. Both of them had a few shallow cuts and scrapes all over their bodies as well. Naruto saw that the car had been knocked to the side of the road, and was smashed against a tree trunk. Food. Grover mumbled, causing Naruto to slap him. Not now, you fool. Naruto said. He turned his head to see the Minotaur approaching him again. Percy, Sally, I need you both to take this idiot and run to the opposite side of the road. Naruto said seriously, not wanting them to go too far and get attacked by something else. Naruto jumped and used Tsunade's super strength technique to smash his foot into the Minotaur's torso, sending him flying into a tree. However, after a few seconds, the Minotaur lumbered back to its feet. Hum, so it is not greatly affected by blunt force trauma. Ninjutsu it is then, lightning release. False darkness. Naruto said, letting out a massive bolt of red lightning from his mouth, which roasted the Minotaur alive. However, Naruto knew the fight was not over, as the Minotaur had not disintegrated yet. Durable, I see, but it seems he is knocked out. Naruto said, blitzing towards the unconscious Minotaur. Dance of the Willow. He muttered, as a long bone extended from his forearm through his palm. Naruto stabbed the Minotaur straight through its chest, and this was something that even the durable Minotaur could not handle as it had burst into golden dust, leaving behind two enormous black and white horns with extremely sharp points. Naruto picked them up and stored them in his Kamui dimension, not wanting to waste what could be valuable resources in the future. He turned to see Percy and Sally looking at him in awe, but he noticed that some of his father's energy signature was gathered around Sally. Without a word, Naruto was next to her in an instant as he activated the Rinnegan. Prada Path he called, absorbing all of his father's energy into himself. Hum, it seems father was trying to summon her soul. The energy signature felt similar to the chakra released after a summoning jutsu. I don't know why he was trying to do such a thing, but I am not letting it happen. I really do need to have a word with that man about these drastic actions, Naruto thought. Sally, I am going to need you to expose your neck for a moment, 
Naruto said. Huh, why? Sally asked. I have to do something to protect you. Someone was trying to take you away from here. Naruto said. Oh, alright, but don't try anything funny. Sally said, lifting her hair out of the way. Naruto nodded as he made several one-handed hand seals. Fuinjutsu. Contract release. Naruto said, placing his hand on her bare neck, thus making Sally's soul inaccessible to Hades. He would undo this after talking to Hades about his actions, but until then, Sally would not be allowed to die. Sally felt a tingling sensation at the back of her neck, as she felt the place at which Naruto placed the seal. It still felt normal, but Naruto and Percy were able to see an inky black set of Japanese kanjis on the place where Naruto placed his hand. What is that? Percy asked. Something to protect her from someone, Naruto said cryptically. Percy simply nodded knowing he wouldn't get anything more from his fellow raven. Naruto quickly made two shadow clones to sling Sally and Grover over his back, while he slung Percy over his back. Hey, stop it, what are you doing? Sally yelled. We don't have the luxury to loiter around here. It is not safe. Naruto said, as he and his shadow clones ran towards the place where they sensed a huge amount of energy that was similar to Percy's energy signature. Sally struggled in his grasp. You have to leave me behind. I cannot get through the property line, she shouted indignantly. Not an option, Naruto said, as he made a tri-prong kanai from his bone. The kanai had kanjis engraved over its handle. Naruto threw the kanai over the property line, as he intoned, Horishin. Neither Percy nor Sally were prepared when they zoomed over the property line at gut-wrenching speeds, as Naruto landed and caught the kanai, which was still flying through the air when he landed. Let me go, man, I'm gonna hurl. Percy mumbled, as Naruto and his shadow clones set Percy, Sally, and Grover down. Percy and Sally seemed very green. Naruto made a few hand seals as he chanted, Sage Art, Healing Fox Flames. Green flames erupted from Naruto's mouth as they almost flowed over Percy, Grover, and Sally, healing their injuries and reducing the sickness Percy and Sally felt from the extreme speed of the horizon. All three of them slowly got up and looked at Naruto. Ah, Naruto we are finally here, huh? Grover asked. We are, Grover. Naruto said. I d don't believe it. I am a mortal and you got me across the property line, Sally said. Whoa, wait, what? What is this about you being a mortal? Everyone is a mortal, right? Percy asked unsurely. Percy, I think you should take a break until daybreak. Maybe get some sleep. I'm sure Chiron will explain everything to you then, Grover said. Chiron? Percy asked. You know him as Mr. Brunner, Naruto said. Wait what, Mr. Brunner is the Chiron? The trainer of heroes, Percy asked incredulously. He is, just accept it, Naruto said. Ah, I see all of you have made it, a pleasant voice said from a distance. Percy turned and felt that his eyes might pop out of their sockets if he was more surprised than this. A. N. When Chiron is posing as Mr. Brunner, his dialogues and thoughts will be written in regular font. Otherwise, his dialogues and thoughts will be in bold. Of course, Percy knew that Chiron was a centaur, but seeing his sleek, alabaster fur coat and long horse legs with his own eyes was a different experience. The group also saw a pretty blonde girl with stormy gray eyes standing next to Chiron. She seemed to have a barely restrained look of jealousy on her face. I apologize for not being there to help you all out. You seem quite tired. I came rushing as I felt a disturbance in the barrier. Why don't you all come to the infirmary? I can have you checked for any injuries as you recuperate, Chiron suggested. Percy, Sally, and Grover looked at Naruto. You three carry on with him. I will catch up later, Naruto said with a wave. As they nodded and got to their feet, Chiron called Naruto. How will you know where the infirmary is? he asked. I can sense their energy signatures. I will be able to find them, Naruto said. Chiron simply nodded, trusting Naruto's judgment, as he led the other three to the infirmary. Naruto watched them leave until they had taken a turn and he could no longer see them. He then turned towards the large pine tree that the barrier seemed to be concentrated at. There is a soul in that tree, Naruto thought as he walked towards it. Naruto tapped into his abilities as the son of Hades, as he put a hand on the tree trunk. 
Immediately, his consciousness was sucked in. He made sure to have partial awareness of his body, which was still outside the tree, before his astral projection walked through this mindscape. As he explored, he saw that the place was very plain. It was similar in color to his Kamui dimension. Finally, after several turns in the labyrinthine mindscape, Naruto located the soul he felt. He saw a beautiful girl with long, spiky, jet black hair. She had electric blue eyes and frecks on her face, which were concentrated near her nose. She wore goth-style garments, which reminded Naruto of a punk-style musician that he once had the displeasure of meeting, a black shirt with a black leather jacket, as well as black tattered jeans. She also wore chain jewelry, skull earrings, and black eyeliner. Man, I never knew that someone else took inspiration from how I dress, she commented, looking at Naruto's attire. Excuse me but who are you, and what is this place? Naruto asked. It's rude to ask for someone else's name without offering your own, the girl said. Apologies, my name is Naruto Uzumaki, Naruto said. See, now that wasn't so hard, was it? My name is Talia Grace, and we are in limbo, the now named Talia said. Naruto was confused as to what Talia meant by saying they were in limbo. So, you are saying we both are half dead? he asked curiously. Talia had to give him props for staying calm when discussing such a topic. Something like that, but I don't think that is the case with you. You are still perfectly alive, but your consciousness is over here with me, Talia said. Strange, but what are you doing here? I did not see your body outside this tree, but I sensed your soul inside it, Naruto inquired. PFF, that's because my body is the fucking tree. Talia snorted, but Naruto could hear a slight resentment in her voice. I see, that is quite weird, are you some sort of dryad, by any chance? Your energy signature is similar to that of a demigod, but seeing as you were inside this tree, I can't help but be curious, Naruto said. It's a long story, man. You sure you got the time? Talia asked nonchalantly. I can increase the amount of time I have to spend talking to you. Look into my eyes. Naruto said. My, my, how forward of you. We just met, Naruto, imagine what the others would think, Talia said playfully, unaware that she was figuratively twisting Naruto's heart with a wrench because of how much she reminded Naruto of Anko. Naruto suppressed his emotions, as he looked into Talia's eyes. Sukuyomi. Naruto said, his Mangeku Sharingan spinning into the familiar three-bladed shuriken shape. Talia's eyes widened as she found herself within Naruto's Tsukuyomi world. W what did you do to me? Talia asked fearfully. Welcome to my realm of Tsukuyomi, where I control everything. Space, time, and the sequence of events that take place are all my domains here. I have slowed down the passage of time so that one second in the outside world is 24 hours here, Naruto said grandiosely. Naruto looked at the fearful expression on Talia's face, wondering if he should have warned her first, but her expression broke into a grin. Man, that was fucking awesome. How did you do that? I wonder what other techniques you have up your sleeve, Talia said incredulously. Thank you, Talia, now, your story, if you don't mind, Naruto said. Oh, don't give me that, mister. I will tell you my story, in exchange for yours. I want to know how you got that Tsukiyomi technique you used. And other stuff too, it gets pretty boring in here, Talia said excitedly. Very well, I suppose that's only fair. I will give you some of my history. And for future reference, it is called Tsukuyomi, Naruto said. Cool, now, listen up, Talia said, as she began her explanation. A. N. She tells him the same backstory as her canon one. I see that was quite a life you led, and your father seemed to be unnecessarily cruel to you. Why is that, have you done something to anger him, or is it something else? Naruto asked, as Talia's expression soured. Naruto noted that her tone now carried some venom to it. No, that is simply how the gods are, those imbeciles. Apparently, my father had the gall to say that he turned me into a tree as a kindness. Can you fucking believe that? Talia hissed. It is hard to believe someone would do that to their daughter, but it doesn't surprise me. More than likely your father used this, kindness, excuse to do away with you, because of the oath that the big three took, Naruto concluded. 
I'm right with you there, man. But I'm sure it's nothing a swift kick in his nuts wouldn't solve, eh? Talia suggested, nudging him with her elbow while sending a sly look at him. Naruto almost cracked a melancholic smile at that. This girl just was too much like Anko, and it was making his heart heavy. Say, I'm no child of Aphrodite, but you just seem so sad, man. I mean like, who hurt you? I haven't seen you smile even once, like am I boring or something? Talia asked hesitantly. Naruto sighed. It's nothing to do with you, Talia. I am fine, there is just a lot on my mind, what with being a demigod and all. He said, giving her a dismissive wave. Bullshit, don't give me that nonsense. I haven't known you for long, as we just met, but I can tell that you have not been happy in a while, Talia said indignantly. Naruto's face broke into a painful smile, as this girl saw right through him, again, just like Anko used to. Even his best friend Itachi did not understand Naruto's feelings as well as Anko did. That was one of the reasons why he allowed her to take his side in the war between him and the elemental nations. Naruto idly wondered whether Talia could be some sort of reincarnation of Anko, made by Kami just to torment him for his sins. I suppose it is time for me to tell you who I am, and about the life that I lived. However, I am going to swear you to secrecy. I haven't told this to even my closest friends here, Naruto said. Finally, and don't worry, I won't tell anyone your secrets. Now get on with it, Suki Omi, Talia said. She outwardly looked excited, but Naruto could tell that she was more apprehensive than excited. My name is Naruto, don't call me by your bastardized pronunciation of the name of my jutsu, Naruto said, slightly annoyed. Whatever, Suki Omi, start with your story. Talia said. You won't stop calling me that, would you? Naruto asked exasperatedly. Talia's mischievous smirk gave him his answer. Whatever. Anyways, I will stand beside you as I play the events of my life in this Sukuyomi realm, Naruto said. Talia grinned. This was going to be interesting. As she nodded and looked into the memories Naruto was showing her, she noticed that Naruto literally was showing her the moment he was born. She looked at him in shock but decided to ask him about this later. His memories blurred, until he was three years old, and had awakened his bloodline, Shikatsumyaku. Talia was quite weirded out by Naruto's bone-related ability, but she continued to watch. Naruto's parents, Minato and Kashina, started training him, and they even rescued his paternal cousin from the Hidden Mist village. His cousin was Kimamaro Kegaya. This was another thing that confused Talia. How could Naruto have both of his parents when he was a demigod? Once again, she decided to save this question for the end. The world that she witnessed in Naruto's memories was extremely dissimilar to the world she lived in, what with parents teaching a toddler how to defend himself from being killed. She continued watching as Naruto's memories blurred past them quickly, until she saw that Kashina sported a distended belly, indicating another pregnancy. Talia even saw in one of Naruto's memories that when he looked in the mirror, his hair was red and white, not black. It was a mix of his Uzumaki mother's and his Kegaya father's hair colors. This added to Talia's expanding pile of questions for Naruto. She also witnessed how Naruto would train by himself, and how he befriended another boy of his age, known as Itachi Uchiha. Talia continued watching till the birth of Naruto's sister, Natsumi. Then came a huge shocker. A masked man had infiltrated the secret room where Natsumi was being birthed, killing all the guards. Talia watched in horror. Of course, she was used to killing monsters, but she never witnessed the scene of people, actual humans, being killed. Adding to that, Naruto witnessed this at the age of five. She could not imagine what he must have felt at the time. After all, the memories did not tell her anything about Naruto's emotions. She watched as the vile man held a weird-looking knife over Natsumi, as Naruto's father flashed at an impossible speed towards the man. He snatched Natsumi from his grasp, but had to discard the blanket and escape, as bombs were planted on it somehow. Then Talia saw something that she really, really hoped to never see in her life, a mountain-sized fox with nine tails that swished behind it. She looked incredulously at Naruto, who was staring unflinchingly at his memories. She witnessed as he ran towards the fox, at an insane speed that should not be possible to achieve for a five-year-old. Or even an adult for that matter. 
Why the hell was he running towards it, and not away? She got her answer as she saw his father facing the fox on his own. She did not know what happened to the masked man from before. As Naruto ran faster, Minato did some weird teleportation thing and emerged a few seconds later with Natsumi and Kashina. She wondered why the man needed his wife, who had just given birth, and his infant child to fight such a creature. She was shocked when glowing chains emerged from an exhausted Kashina's back and held the beast in place. She saw Minato make some weird markings on the infant, as some red energy from the fox started getting absorbed into the baby. In what seemed like a last-ditch attempt, the fox was about to stab a massive claw at the baby. Talia was about to yell, no. However, before the claw could do damage, Naruto had vanished in an ungodly burst of speed and appeared in front of his sister. However, Talia did not see a massive claw sticking out of Naruto's torso. Instead, she saw as the fox quickly got sucked into the weird markings and Naruto fell unconscious. From then on, she witnessed how Naruto unlocked his elemental bloodlines, trained harder, discovered shadow clones, a technique that intrigued her to no end, became a genin with his academy friends Itachi Uchiha and Anko Midarashi, and so on. She saw that Naruto's sensei was a pale-skinned man named Orochimaru, who for some reason, repulsed her. She watched as Naruto, at an age when kids would be playing with others in parks, would carry out missions, kill enemies, and become stronger, slowly climbing his way up the shinobi hierarchy. Talia was sad when Naruto's teammate, Anko, had gone off with his evil sensei to leave the village, but Naruto still stared emotionlessly at his memories. It seemed that he had already come to terms with them. She was also horrified when Naruto and Itachi were given an order, by a bunch of old people she did not like, to kill Itachi's clan for treason. She was even more mortified when these 13-year-olds accepted the mission and carried it out. They even killed Itachi's parents who also had a familial relation with Naruto, causing Talia to regret asking Naruto for his story. Things got darker as Naruto's cousin Kimimaro had died a few days after the massacre due to an illness related to his bloodline. She was shocked when Naruto had come to know of an organization of S-ranked criminals known as the Akatsuki, who were after his sister and eight other people with beings like the nine-tailed fox sealed inside them. Itachi had joined the organization to spy on them but Sasuke thought he massacred his clan on a whim, and developed a hatred for him. This saddened Talia, as a man willing to go to such lengths for his village was despised by his brother for his actions. Naruto went on a training trip for five years, during when he actually made his own organization, Hania, to stop the Akatsuki's movements. He collected members and trained them so that they would reach the required level to deal with such a threat. Naruto had created a blood clone, which he sent back to the Hidden Leaf Village to become the sensei of three genin, among which Talia could see Naruto's sister and Itachi's younger brother, Sasuke Uchiha. His original self was coordinating the operations of Hania Talia watched as Naruto literally beat out the flaws from his students, recklessness from his sister, fanderlish attitude from the Pinket, Sakura Haruno, and arrogance from Sasuke. As she watched, she suddenly realized that Naruto was a lot older than he looked right now, but she waited to see an explanation in his memories for this. After an exam to promote his students to the next rank, the original Naruto had returned to the village to help Minato out against Orochimaru, who had invaded. His blood clone had been sent on a mission, so it was unavailable. However, he was too late, as after he finished off Orochimaru and those he reanimated, Minato died in his arms, succumbing to his wounds from his battle. He also had the same disease as Kimimaro, causing his death to happen even quicker. Naruto was then made the leader of his village, the Hokage, but he substituted himself with his blood clone, so that he could return to Hania. He then had his godfather, Jiraiya, and his mother, take his students on a training trip, in order to have the Hania members prepare them against the Akatsuki. After three years they all returned to the village. Naruto's life once again took a dark turn, after his request for the other villages to ally with him against the Akatsuki, a common enemy, was denied. Naruto realized that for peace to be achieved, a common enemy for all the villages must be created. He decided that he was the only one strong enough to become such a villain, and die by the efforts of the other villages to create peace. He explained his plan to his mother, who begged him not to do such a thing. However, Naruto insisted, and Kashina told him to kill her, 
as she couldn't bear to pain of losing both Minato and him. She wanted him to join her and Minato in the pure world after his death. Naruto tearfully extended a bone from his palm, but he was doubtful about actually going through with what his mother asked of him. Before he could change his mind, Kashina quickly rushed into him, causing the bone to impale her heart and kill her. Talia saw drops fall onto the corpse of Naruto's mother, before realizing they were his tears. This earned Naruto the hatred of Natsumi when she found out, as Naruto left a note for her. Naruto left the village, he already did, but he wanted people to actually see him leave and hunted down the remaining Akatsuki members. After defeating a man who called himself Pain, much to the amusement of Talia, Talia's expression changed to one of disgust as Naruto extracted the eyes from Pain's emaciated corpse and replaced his own with them. She watched as Naruto visited his friend Itachi, asking him to join him for the goal of world peace, but Itachi was so trapped in his guilt that it had taken a toll on his health. He hadn't told anyone about this problem, and it had become too late, as Itachi was about to die. No matter what medical technique Naruto tried, Itachi did not get better. Naruto even tried using one of his new eye abilities, the Naraka Path, to heal Itachi, but it did not work either, as Itachi's condition was a chakra illness, whatever that meant. Itachi, tired of Naruto trying to save him, told Naruto that as he was about to die anyway, he wanted to have one last battle with his oldest friend, and Naruto sadly complied. They fought to the death, and Naruto emerged as the victor, though Talia was absolutely amazed by his power. Naruto took his eyes as well, so that they wouldn't fall into the wrong hands. As she watched the rest of Naruto's life until now play out, explained in the first chapter, she was stupefied by how much he had lived through. She even shed a few tears of her own, seeing a life that was so, tragic. Oh my god, how are you even sane after living through so much pain, Talia all but screamed tearfully. I just had to come to terms with what happened, and don't give me your sympathy. That is unnecessary, you told me your story, and I told you mine. That is all there is to it, Naruto said. But still, Talia started to retort, but Naruto quickly held up a hand to silence her. Among the people of this world, you lived quite a tough life too. Do you crib and whine about it? Naruto asked. Well, no, but, Talia replied before Naruto cut her off. And there you have it. In the world that I come from, people face all kinds of tragedies, often much worse than events that occur here. Do you know what they do? They simply accept that unfortunate things happened, and move on. Those who don't tend to die quickly, Naruto said coldly. Talia slowly nodded, remembering how different Naruto's world was from her own. All her questions about Naruto had been answered when Naruto showed her his interaction with the Sage of Six Paths. So, I am talking to a 5,000-year-old man from a pocket dimension of the Earth, huh, Talia said. You are. Naruto said simply. Why did you only choose to tell me this, Talia asked. I will tell you later. Naruto said with a small smile tugging at his lips. Yeah sure, Suki Omi. And I assume you won't tell me where your powers come from either. There is no demigod in existence that has the kind of abilities that you do. Talia said. That I can actually tell you. Shinobi have descended from the gods of the Shinto pantheon, known to us as the Otsutsuki clan, Naruto said. Wait that clan that caused you so much trouble is made of the gods you worship, Talia asked incredulously. It is but only the branch members of the clan who lusted for power tried to harm shinobi. They were kicked out of the main family due to their power-hungry nature, Naruto said. Damn, you literally fought and killed gods. No wonder you're so strong, Talia said. Right, I shall take my leave now. By the way, I will also find some way to get you out of this tree. You don't deserve to be imprisoned like this, Naruto said. Talia smiled, just like Anko. Naruto took one last glance at her. She really was Anko in every way but her appearance. Maybe a bit less sadistic too. I would say that you shouldn't bother, as people have tried and failed before, but I think if anyone can do it, it's you. Talia said softly, looking at his retreating form. Naruto nodded before undoing the Tsukuyomi and exited the tree. He got up to see that an hour had already passed in the real world outside the tree. Zeus must have done something to make the time pass much slower in Talia's tree, so that she wouldn't have to suffer as much. 
However, Naruto still had no life for the king of the gods for doing such a thing to his own daughter. Naruto was still willing to hear him out for his explanation though. He had learned through experience that situations were not as black and white as they seemed. Naruto made it to the infirmary, where Chiron told him to meet him and the company he arrived with. He saw Percy, Sally, and Grover resting on the cots. Grover looked as if he had just regained his consciousness, and the blonde girl Naruto saw beside Chiron was feeding him small spoonfuls of what appeared to be an amber-colored pudding. However, Naruto could tell that it was no normal food, even if he did not know exactly what it was. Hello, my boy, how are you feeling? Chiron asked pleasantly. I'm all right, Chiron, thank you for your concern. How are they? Naruto asked, gesturing to Percy, Sally, and Grover. They will be all right, they simply need to rest for the night, Chiron said. I see, so now that we are here, what is next? I know Percy and myself well enough to understand that we are good at attracting annoyances like the Minotaur that attacked us on our way here, Naruto said. Well, you are right about that. Now, moving on to what I actually wanted to ask you, how did you get Sally through the barrier protecting Camp Half-Blood, Chiron asked. Just one of my techniques that allows me to teleport, Naruto said cryptically. I see, it couldn't be helped, I will show you the means to contact me which you must do before allowing anyone who usually wouldn't be permitted to pass through the barrier. Am I clear? Chiron said seriously. Crystal. Naruto said. Chiron smiled as he nodded and walked out of the infirmary, to go and do, whatever he does in his free time. Naruto turned to the three people on the cots, causing them to look up at him. I will be exploring the camp. Will all of you need anything? Naruto asked. I think we'll be fine, Naruto but I think you should get some sleep. It's been a long day for us, Sally suggested. Unnecessary. Anyway, if any of you need me, impale this into something and I will be there instantly, Naruto said, as a tri-prong kanai, with strange runes engraved on its handle, extended out of his palm. Gross, man, I'm not touching your bones, Percy said. If hygiene is a concern for you, no need to worry. The bones that I manifest outside my body kill any pathogens due to my chakra-based immune system, and they are as dry as, well, bones. They have no traces of other tissues either. Also, if you get repulsed by the thought of touching a bone, you will never be able to fight against beings like Mrs. Dodds, Naruto said. Fine, you have a point, Percy conceded. Naruto simply placed the kunai at Percy's bedside and left the infirmary. He walked outside to see that the landscape was dotted with buildings that looked like ancient Greek architecture, an open-air pavilion, an amphitheater, a circular arena, except that they all looked brand new, their white marble columns glittering in the moonlight. Naruto looked at the clear, starry sky, free of pollution. At this camp, it seemed that the skies were much clearer than any other place Naruto had been to. He could say the same about the lake, which had dozens of canoes floating near the shore, tied to poles to keep them from floating away. He had secretly been sending shadow clones to all parts of the world to carry out his plans to make the world more, natural. He had no relation to Pan, Demeter, Persephone, Artemis, or any nature-related god or goddess for that matter, but he could appreciate the peace of mind that nature brought, like how it was in the elemental nations. However, he had still never seen a place on the earth that was as pure as what he was seeing before him now. There were twelve cabins, similar in size to the one in Montauk that Naruto saw when he accompanied Percy and Sally. They were quite strangely designed. One was shaped like a white marble bank, another looked as if it was made of pure gold, another was a similar one, but silver instead, another had grapevines draped around it, and so on. In the middle, there was a hearth, which was being tended to by a young girl who appeared to be around the age of eight. However, Naruto could feel the divine energy that the girl exuded, the warmth of which led him to conclude that she was Hestia. The fact that she was tending to the hearth also helped Naruto identify her. There were trees all around the camp, and Naruto also saw some nature spirits, like dryads and naiads, stare curiously at him, before turning away when he looked at them. Some satyrs stirred to look at him as well, but they had looks of jealousy on their faces at Naruto getting attention from the female nature spirits. Other than that, 
There were several bushes laden with ripe and plump strawberries, which were probably enhanced to grow better by the nature spirits. Naruto was restraining himself from picking one, when he sensed a powerful presence approach him. What are you doing out here so late, Hiro? The voice asked, spitting the last word out with some venom. Naruto turned to see a small, but porky man. He had a red nose, big watery eyes, and curly hair so black it was almost purple. His face reminded Naruto of paintings of baby angels, cherubs. His face was like a middle-aged cherub. He also wore a tiger pattern Hawaiian shirt, and Naruto got the impression that this being would fit in with Gabe and his gambling buddies, had he not killed the man. Ah, I presume you are Lord Dionysus. Sorry if I got it wrong. I am a little new here, Naruto said. You are correct, I am quite impressed. None of the dunderheads in this blasted camp was able to guess my identity on their first try so far. Perhaps you might make things more interesting around here, Dionysus said. No offense, but I don't believe that you gods approach demigods as a social visit. Why are you here? Naruto asked. Hmm, straight to the point I see. I like you, kid. But make sure you are a bit more respectful next time, or I will turn you into an Atlantic bottlenose dolphin, Dionysus said. You won't be able to, Naruto asserted. Oh, are you challenging me? I am resisting the temptation of turning you into one right now. Don't test my patience, boy, Dionysus sneered. You can try, but you will fail, Naruto said with a shrug. That's it, feel my wrath now, boy. I don't care what your godly parent says next, Dionysus said furiously, his eyes blazing with purple flames. He directed his magical energy at Naruto, who stared unflinchingly. However, nothing happened to Naruto, puzzling Dionysus. You, what are you, boy? A mere demigod must not be able to remain unaffected by my curse, Dionysus yelled. Naruto was surprised at the weakness of Dionysus' curse. He felt a slight tingle in his chakra network that was trying to force a transformation jutsu, but Naruto quickly disrupted it and returned his chakra to normal. I am a demigod, and you don't need to worry, as I will be an ally of the gods, but I do not take well to threats. If you gods try to threaten me to make me serve you, you may consider my allegiance to you all terminated. You and the other gods have become far too comfortable having the demigods wrapped around your fingers, unable to choose their path in life. Any suggestions or ideas that demigods gave were snuffed out by all of your superiority complexes. The gods seem to have this perception that just because they are older and more experienced, demigods should bow to them. No, in order to keep me on your side, we must have a mutual respect between each other. Am I understood? Naruto questioned seriously. Dionysus had to take a moment to calm himself after Naruto's display of dominance. How am I supposed to know that you could add much value by being our ally? Dionysus asked. Perhaps a spar between us will serve as a demonstration. A fair warning though. I killed the fates with ease, so that should give you an idea of what kind of power I possess. Naruto said. The fates? What? That's impossible. Dionysus said angrily. Perhaps you could confirm this if you have some sort of means to contact them. Naruto suggested. Dionysus quickly iris messaged the fates, as he called, Clotho. However, the iris message failed. No, 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 this can't be happening. The iris message system must be having a glitch or something. Let us spar, I will see your abilities for myself, Dionysus commanded. As you wish, Naruto said as he put his palm on Dionysus' shoulder, and before he could react, the both of them were sucked into the Kamui dimension. What is this place? Dionysus asked. Welcome to my personal Kamui dimension. While fighting here, we will be able to use the full extent of our abilities without worrying about collateral damage, Naruto said. Dionysus gulped at this show of ability by Naruto. Just how many more abilities did this brat have? However, he assumed his stance and prepared for this fight. He would have to take this seriously. When Dionysus took a stance that showed that he probably never fought a hand-to-hand -hand battle before, Naruto almost laughed, but his years of practice controlling his emotions kept his face relaxed and stoic. All right, Dionysus, let's dance, Naruto said as he launched himself towards Dionysus at about a quarter of his full speed. Dionysus did not even see him move, 
until Naruto appeared right in front of him and his right foot came crashing into his abdomen. Dionysus hacked out Golden Icor, as he went flying towards a wall. He crashed into it, leaving a deep crater. Damn, this kid punches as hard as father, Dionysus grunted. However, he was given no time to recover as a, was that a bone? A bone was about to pierce his chest. Dionysus quickly took to the air as he used his ability to levitate, in order to escape the bone blade. He was a god, but he could still feel pain. It is quite the unpleasant experience. He collected his energy at his mouth, as he expelled a vast amount of purple flame towards Naruto. Naruto mirrored his actions by unleashing a sea of flames himself. Fire release. Great flame demolition, he called as he held his hands together in a horse hand seal. Dionysus was stunned, as this demigod easily countered one of his best fire attacks. However, he did not have time to get over his shock, as a spine whip. What the hell was up with this kid's abilities? He shook his head as he flew higher to avoid the whip. However, before he could think of a counterattack, the boy appeared behind him and held him in a full Nelson. Before Dionysus could escape, the one holding him, who was actually a shadow clone of Naruto's, became covered in a bone armor. However, Dionysus did not expect the next move. Dance of the Chestnut. Nutcracker, the shadow clone cried, as it exploded. This caused Dionysus to become seriously injured, not only from the explosion, but also from the bits of bone shrapnel that pierced deep into his skin, making it painful to move. However, Dionysus was not done yet. He wiped some ichor that dripped from his mouth, before holding his hands forward. Massive trees emerged from the ground and attempted to ensnare Naruto, whose actual body had been detected by Dionysus, in their branches. Lightning release. Electromagnetic murder. Naruto muttered, frying the trees to a crispy ash with thousands of volts of electricity. Dionysus' eyes widened in shock. His lightning is almost as strong as father's master bolt. How is he even able to use father's domain? Dionysus thought to himself, as Naruto appeared a few feet in front of him. Hum, a wood user. This will be a treat for you, Shodaim sama Naruto said, as he made the tiger, snake, dog, and dragon hand seals. Impure world. Reincarnation. Naruto called flamboyantly, as a coffin raised from the ground. All that work to summon a public toilet stall out of the ground. Dionysus asked incredulously. Naruto ignored him as the coffin door opened to reveal a tall, dark-haired man dressed in old samurai armor. However, his most prominent features were the strange cracks that ran across his skin. Welcome to the world of the living, Shodaim sama Naruto said respectfully, as the man opened his eyes to reveal a black sclera. In fact, even his natural iris color was also close to black, making it seem like each of his eyeballs were entirely black, rather creepy, Dionysus would comment if someone asked him. Ah, Naruto-kun, have you been keeping peace in the world like you said? The man from the coffin, Hashirama Senju, asked lightheartedly. Dionysus was shocked that this man was just making light conversation in the middle of the battle. I have arranged a system to maintain it, but we have more important matters to attend to. This man is a wood user. Perhaps you would like to test yourself against another wood user, Naruto asked. Naruto was simply toying with Dionysus, by showing him so many of the cards he had in his hand to make him pay dearly if he angered him. He would show Dionysus that he would work for the gods, but for all practical purposes, the gods were his bitches. Wow, how interesting, a descendant of mine, Hashirama asked. No, not really, but he is capable of using the infamous wood release ability. Naruto said. Hum, so be it, then. Show me what you are capable of, warrior, Hashirama said enthusiastically to Dionysus, before pressing his palms to the floor. Wood release. Deep forest emergence, Hashirama called. Dionysus was sweating in fear, at seeing the number of trees that emerged from the ground. There were hundreds of thousands of them, all rapidly growing sharp branches that attempted to stab the poor god. Dionysus quickly regained his composure and made multiple vines erupt from the ground, ensnaring the trees and poisoning them, in order to kill them. He tried to use his madness manipulation on Hashirama and Naruto, but neither even flinched at his attempts. However, he was brought out of his thoughts with a call of, Wood Release, Wood Dragon. 
by Hashirama. Dionysus turned to see a massive wooden Asian dragon, several times larger than the largest of whales, approach him at an ungodly speed. Ungodly, because he, a god, would probably be damaged beyond repair if that dragon hit him. Shit, thorned vines, Dionysus yelled, unleashing his most potent wood technique at the dragon. Thick, thorned vines wrapped around the construct, before it unleashed a massive roar and tore the vines apart. However, the purpose of the vines was to inject pure ethanol into the dragon through the thorns, trying to overpower Hashirama's control over it. An innovative attempt, my friend, but I am afraid that won't work, Hashirama said, as he flooded the dragon with chakra, purging the alcohol from it. The dragon swooped at Dionysus, who could not avoid it this time. It snapped its massive jaws around the poor god, as it clamped them shut, crushing Dionysus' torso. Enough, enough, I concede, Naruto, you win, the broken god said, tears rolling down his cheeks as he was let out of the dragon's mouth. The dragon disappeared and Hashirama was summoned back into his coffin. Very good, and if you try anything with or without the other gods to attempt harming me in any way, shape, or form, I will make you fade, Dionysus. Am I clear? Naruto asked. Yes, yes, you are, I am sorry for doubting you. You will have my respect from now on, Dionysus cried. Perfect, now, let me heal you, Naruto said. Dionysus looked up hopefully, as Naruto made a few hand seals and chanted, Sage Art, healing fox flames. All of Dionysus' injuries healed within seconds. Naruto held his hand out, and guided his bone shrapnel, which were still embedded in Dionysus' body, out and destroyed them with fire manipulation. Dionysus was amazed at everything he witnessed so far. His father would get annihilated by this boy, no, man, if he tried anything funny against him. Dionysus was a little confused by the chat that Naruto had with Hashirama, but he decided to save the question for another time. Naruto then put his palm on Dionysus' shoulder, warping the both of them out of the Kamui dimension. As Dionysus was about to nod his head at Naruto and leave to retire for the night, Naruto stopped him. I'd like to assume that after tonight's events, we have reached an understanding, Naruto said. It was disguised as a question, but it clearly was not one. Dionysus nodded and said, You know, I was only going warn you about the cleaning harpies at Camp Half-Blood, that could attack you if you wander around in the night, but after everything that happened, I think you can handle yourself. And thank you for showing me how blind I was to my godly arrogance, Naruto Uzumaki, Dionysus said. Naruto smiled and nodded, as he took a deep breath and thought of what life would have in store for him next, before taking a seat and gazing at the stars. Beautiful, isn't it? said a melodious but childish voice from behind him. Of course, Naruto had noticed the speaker arrive through his sensory abilities, but he decided to allow this person to approach him as he felt no malice from her intentions. Hello, Lady Hestia, nice to meet you, Naruto said as the girl smiled mischievously. To be continued, remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.